meeting of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the Commission on Appointments in the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll of members. The Honorable Officers and Members of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, Vice Chairperson Senator Maria Lourdes Nancy S. Binay, Representative Ferginel G. Biron, MD, Senator Christopher Bong T. Go, Present. Senator Lauren Legarda, Representative Rodante D. Marcoleta, Present. Representative Lani Mercado Revilla, Representative Jose Gay G. Padiernos, Senator Francis Tol N. Tolentino, Members, Senator Francis Cheese G. Escudero, Representative Albert S. Garcia, Representative Greg G. Gasataya, Senator Lisa Ontiveros, Representative Oscar Oka G. Malapitan, Senator Amy R. Marcos, Senator Grace Poe, Representative Jordine Jesus M. Romualdo, Representative Manuel T. Sagarbaria, Senator Cynthia A. Villar, our ex officio members, Vice Chairperson Representative Ramon N. Guico Jr., Majority Floor Leader Representative Luis Raymond Elder F. Villafuerte Jr., Assistant Majority Floor Leader Senator Joseph Victor G. Ejercito, Minority Floor Leader Senator Alan Peter Compañero S. Cayetano, Assistant Minority Floor Leader Representative Johnny T. Pimentel. Present. The chairperson is present. Uh, Senator Cynthia Villar is present. Thank you. With the uh, eight uh, members present in person, including the chair, and uh, seven members present online, with a total of uh, 15 members present, the existence of a quorum is hereby declared. The uh, chair acknowledges the presence of Senators uh, Nancy Binay and Riz Ontiveros, Vice Chair Congressman Monchinguico, Congressman Dante Marcoleta, Congressman Gay Padiernos, Congressman Malapitan, Congressman Sagarbaria, and those press those uh, present online online are uh, Senator Senator Bongo, Senator Cynthia Villar, Senator Marcos. Senator Amy Marcos, Congressman uh, Johnny Pimentel, Congresswoman Lani Mercado Revilla, and Congressman Biron. Majority Leader. Mr. Chair, I move to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the meeting okay. held on March 15, 2023, and to consider the same as approved. Before that, uh, before we act on the uh, Motion, I would like also to acknowledge Congressman Abit uh, Garcia. There is a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the previous meeting and consider the same as approved. Is there any objection? There being none, the reading of the minutes of the meeting held on March 15, 2023 is dispensed with and the same is considered approved. Esteemed members of the Commission on Appointments, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This morning, the body will consider the nominations of the following seven officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs, all career A AEPs, with one returning to the service after his retirement only last December 2022 as a political nominee designate A AEP to Oman, Raul Hernandez. Namely, number one, Henry C. Cat ben Surto Jr., Chief of Mission Class 1, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of Turkey with concurrent jurisdiction over Georgia and the Republic of Azerbaijan. Number two, Raul Salav Salavaria Hernandez, Ambassador Extraordinary, Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Sultanate of Oman with the salary and emoluments of Chief of Mission Class One. Number three, Renato Pedro Oabel Villa, Chief of Mission Class One as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with concurrent jurisdiction of the Republic over the Republic of Yemen. Number four, Carlos de Mexoreta, Chief of Mission Class One as permanent representative of the Republic of the Philippines to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. Number five, Maria Angela Abrera Ponce, Chief of Mission Class Two as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Malaysia. Number six, Paul Raymond Pasion Cortez, 
Chief of Mission Class 2 as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Portuguese Republic with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Cabo Verde, the Republic of Guinea-Bissau, the Dem Democratic Republic of uh, Sao Tome and Principe, and the Republic of Angola. Number seven, Josel, Josel Francisco Ignacio, Chief of Mission, Class Two as Ambassador Extraordinary at Plenipotentiary to the Republic of India, with concurrent jurisdiction, jurisdiction over their Federal Dem Dem Democratic Republic of Nepal. This is the ninth and the last confirmation hearing of the Committee on Foreign Affairs before the first regular session of the 19th Congress of the 19th Congress goes into Senate adjournment. The chair of this committee is pleased to inform the body that, that as of the previous hearing last March 15, 2023, the Committee on Foreign Affairs has recommended and the Commission and Bank gave its consent to 45 nominations and confirmed 68 ad interim appointments of the following officials in the Foreign Service. Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary Permanent Representative in Permanent Missions, total of 34, Chief of Mission 1, 7, Chief of Mission 2, 8, Career Minister 13, FSO 1, 18, FSO 2, 32, with a total of 113. Madam Secretary, please inform the body of the compliance of the of the jurisdictional requirements pursuant to the rules and other relevant information pertaining to the seven nominations under consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, your honors. On May 15 and 16, 2023, your secretariat received the respective nominations of the seven foreign affairs officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs under consideration today. Their nominations were duly referred on May 16, 2023 to the Committee on Foreign Affairs by the Commission Chairperson and Senate President Juan Miguel Migs F. Zubiri pursuant to Section 16, Chapter 5 of the New Rules of the Commission. Likewise, Mr. Chairperson, Your Honors, the nominations under consideration were published on March 23, 2023 and May 18, 2023 in two newspapers of general circulation, the Manila Standard and the Manila Times. And on March 24, 2023 and May 17, 2023, it was broadcast over PTB4 pursuant to Section 2, Article 2 of the Rules of the Standing Committees. The nominees have each complied and submitted complete mandatory documentary requirements pursuant to Section 24, Chapter 6 of the New Rules of the Commission. The Commission Secretariat has not received any opposition against any of the nominees under consideration today. That is all, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Secretary, please administer the oath to all the nominees. May we request all the nominees to please rise and raise your right hands. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? So help you, God. Your response. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the nominees are now all under oath. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Secretary. Who wants to go first? Chair. Uh, majority Madam. Leader. Uh, before that, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator Bongo, who is with us physically. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, a few questions to be asked to at least three of uh, the officials before us today. I'd like to first call on uh, Mr. Henry Sikad Bensurto, Jr. Ambassador Bensurto, you may take Good your morning, seat. sir. Magandang umaga po, sir. Mr. Chair, uh, in the notes provided to us by the Commission, Mr. Bensurto Jr. is one of the Philippines' leading experts on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the South China Sea, or what we refer to as the West Philippine Sea. Will you confirm that, sir? I I have knowledge of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, sir, uh, to the extent that I did uh, some works on the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea, sir. Thank you. Sir, you are one of the leading experts of the country. 
perhaps that you do not consider yourself as one of the experts uh, in all humility your honor i think i have a good working knowledge on the uh, law of the sea uh, uh, as to whether i am a leading expert i leave it up uh, your honor to to people but i would in my confidence have a good working knowledge uh, your honor all right we will accept that um Considering your knowledge, if not expertise, of the UNCLOS and the issues surrounding our disputes in the South China Sea, uh, may I ask if you were one of those who prepared the Philippine Memorial in the permanent arbitration in The Hague? Were you one of them? Thank you for the question, Your Honor. Yes, uh, I did participate in that and was part of those who prepared the memorial together with the rest of the uh, foreign legal councils. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Your for Honor. the answer. I, I noticed that in the memorial, the preliminary drafts included some of the reliefs or remedies sought by the Philippine government from the permanent court of arbitration. But later in the day, the reliefs or remedies were all eliminated, meaning to say they were removed from the petition or from the memorial. Why so? Uh, thank you, Your Honor, for the question. Uh, I think the case as it was evolving and uh, as we were strategi strategizing and as the situation develops, we also adapted to every changes in the situation. For example, on the matter of uh, preliminary uh, relief so that our officials would be allowed to bring food or provisions to our personnel in BRP Sierra Madre, we thought that we will put that uh, even uh, before we file the main case. But at the last minute, Your Honor, after due diligence and further discussion, we thought that in the context of how things were developing, it was better to uh, uh, go into the main case uh, uh, so that uh, uh, when the main case is finally decided, uh, that matter will also be resolved, uh, Your Honor. Thank you. We, we noticed that, uh, and uh, eventually what happened is that the Philippine petition became a strategic move to evade the question of territoriality because I think it is the assumption of the legal panel by the Philippine government that the issue of territoriality or jurisdiction on territory is not within the province of the Court of Arbitration. That is very clear, sir. Uh, Your Honor. Okay, okay. Ganito na lang. When the Philippine memorial or petition finally removed all the reliefs and remedies, what did we ask the arbitral award then? Thank you for the question, Your Honor. I think from the very beginning, uh, as part of the conceptualization, from the very beginning, this is the, the question that we have to resolve is, what is exactly the issue that we have to put forth to a tribunal? And from the very beginning, we know that it, we have to phrase the question correctly. If we phrase the question, who is the owner? Definitely, there will be no jurisdiction because China did not want to participate. And this question would be outside the ambit of the uh, law of the sea. Yes, therefore, yes that, that was the understanding. The yes. question is, when we remove all the reliefs, the, the original reliefs or remedies that the Philippine government should ask from The Hague, what happened? It is as if that we filed a complaint without asking the court to do anything for us. Meaning to say the complainant just filed the case, but the court is limited to just declaring something 
But because we did not ask for anything, let's say asking China to leave the uh, occupied islands or rocks or shoals in the Spratlys, we did not ask anything from the, from the court. So what happened then with our petition? Thank you, Mr. Chair. From the very beginning, we never considered asking the tribunal to decide on the matter of whether or not uh, China or the Philippines uh, own the feature. That okay, was never what part. did we ask? What we asked, uh, Your Honor, is number one, clarification on the, on the matter of the nine dash line, that from our perspective, there was no legal justification for the nine dash line. Second, we requested the tribunal to clarify the characters of the features. Uh, whether or not those features in the Spratlys, they number anywhere between 95 to 295, whether or not these features, especially those that are large, are rocks, low tide elevations, or islands. And then third, the third part of that is whether there was a destruction of the marine environment. Yes, that is correct. You ask only for clarifications. Nothing more and nothing less. That is why even if we won the arbitral, the arbitration, the, the arbitral court didn't ask China to do anything. Like the arbitral court didn't ask China to, uh, to leave the islands or the rocks that it occupies in this Spratlys, some of which are being claimed by the Philippines. Isn't it so? Your Honor, not exactly. We did ask for specific, uh, number one, it was very important to clarify the matter of the Reed Bank, whether or not it is a continental shelf of the Philippines, or is it part of the exclusive economic zone of the features. And that's why, that's why it's very, very critical to prove the character of the features, because if these features were naturally formed islands, and therefore they would be entitled to the maximum entitlement of 200 nautical we, miles. We know that. Who owns, who occupies the Reed Bank now? Your Honor, Reed Bank is completely a continental shelf. Which, which country is now occupying the Reed Bank? Reed Bank is, is exclusively within the 200 nautical mile continent. You are not answering the question. I'm asking you which the, country is now occupying the Reed Bank? Uh, the reason I answer that way, Your Honor, the Philippines, because because it's below the water, Your Honor, uh, you cannot have a structure. But in Mr. That. Chair, the question is very simple. I, I apologize, Your Honor. Which country is now occupying the Reed Bank? My apologies, Your Honor, the Philippines. Right. Which countries, which country are occupying some of the islands that are claimed by the Philippines? but the Philippines does not occupy them. Uh, under PD 1596, we claim uh, that group of islands called uh, Kalean Island Group. However, Your Honor, some of these features uh, that we claim are not occupied by us. In summary, we occupy something like nine features out of the, this uh, group of uh, features. Uh, China occupies something like six, Vietnam occupies something like 26 to 27, Your Honor. No. China is occupying some 20 islands. Uh, Malay, no, no. Vietnam is occupying some 20 islands. China, 14. Malaysia, 4. Philippines, about 6. Ang pinag-uusapan kasi natin ganito, kaya nagkakaroon tayo ng problema. Some of the islands occupied by China in this Pratlis are within the exclusive economic zone of the country, our country. Because China occupies some of those islands and under public international law, they are entitled to territorial sea and their own EEC. It happens that the EEC of that island occupied of China intersects our own exclusive economic zone. Hindi ba? Prior to arbitration, that, that may be correct. With the arbitration, Your Honor, that has been clarified. And that's why there was a very explicit categorical ruling on the part of the tribunal, specifically saying that Reed Bank is exclusively ours. In fact, it even went to the extent of castigating China that they should not harass 
our vessels in Reed Bank. I am not talking about the Reed Bank anymore. Yung sinasabi ko, an island occupied by China, which is within the exclusive economic zone of our country, intersects or, or overlaps with that entitlement of its own economic zone. Ganito yun eh. China occupies one, one island, and because it occupies one island, it enjoys the territorial sea and the EEZ of that island it occupies. Tama. Nor, Your Honor, because the tribunal declared that none of the features were islands. In fact, including the biggest one, Ituaba, is just a rock. That being the case, under Article 121 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, a rock will only be entitled to 12 nautical miles. And the low tide elevation, including Mischief Reef and Ayungin Shoal, are low tide elevations and therefore are not territorial questions, but they definitively belong to the continental shelf exclusively of the Philippines. That being the case, Your Honor, the, the previous overlap in the past between EEZs supposedly, theoretically, no longer existed, principally because none of the features in the Spratlys project 200 nautical miles. Thank you, Your Honor. Alam mo, hindi tayo magkakaintindihan pagka gano'n na sagot mo eh. The arbitral award even clarified that the ownership of China in those islands did not change their status as occupant in those islands. Ganito yun eh. Siyang nag-occupy and we cannot ask them to leave. Kaya ko pinipili dito because the impression is that because we won in the arbitral uh, rule, uh, we won in the arbitration, in the Chinese, China versus Philippine arbitration. Nanalo tayo, ang buong akala ng mga kababayan natin, pinaaalis ang China do sa ino-occupy na, na mga islands in the Sprat list. That did not happen. You have to clarify this. Thank you, uh, Your Honor, for the question, if I may. Regardless of who the owners of the features, and this is what the tribunal said, regardless of who owns the features, those features, regardless of who the owner is, will only be entitled to 12 nautical miles at the most if it is a rock. That being the case, none of the features, regardless of who the owners are, which is beyond the jurisdiction of the tribunal, because they are only entitled to 12 nautical miles, there is no possibility of overlap uh, between exclusive economic zones because in that situation only the Philippine archipelago projected from the Philippine archipelago features are entitled to 200 nautical miles. The features in the Sprat list, none of them, Your Honor, anywhere between 95 to 295, including the largest of them, Ituaba, is not, is not, is not an island, are, are only rocks at the most, and that being the case, will only be entitled to 12 nautical miles. The consequence of that ruling, therefore, is there's no possibility of overlap. This allowed, therefore, the, rule, the tribunal to make a very categorical ruling, very specific, Your Honor, in the Reed Bank, which, by the way, before the arbitration, China was saying it's part of the disputed area, was no longer disputed. Thank you. Okay, Lord. even assuming that you are correct that it has no EEC, but under public international law, if it is an island, it is entitled to two things, the 12 nautical miles and its own economic zones. Palagay mo, palagay mo, tama ka. What about the 12 nautical miles? Suppose China is occupying that island. China can enjoy the 12 nautical miles sea surrounding that island, isn't it? Uh, if it is a rock, Your Honor, it will be entitled to... Uh, sabi ko nga, island nga si... if, uh, Your Honor, the reason I'm very uh, specific in the use of terms because if I mention it island, definitely it will be entitled to 200. The reason I'm mentioning rock is to be more specific and technical. Okay, it's a rock, so it's entitled to 12 nautical miles. Or supposing China, as an occupant of that rock, which is entitled to 12 nautical miles, ipinarada niya yung kanyang mga vessels doon. And the 12 nautical miles overlaps with the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Tama. Kasi nandun siya sa 12 nautical miles eh. 
This is now the problem because ang sabi natin, oh, ang China uh, nandun siya sa ating exclusive economic zone. But, hindi natin siya pwede paalisin because as occupant of that rock or feature, nandun siya sa 12 nautical miles. Tama? Tama you know, like, ite. Yes. O, oh, yun na nga. Eh. Expect to that. Ito yung problema nga natin. Kailangan maipaliwanag natin kasi ang mga kababayan natin nakukonfuse. O, oh, nandun siya sa exclusive economic zone natin. Sabi nila. Totoo naman yun eh. But China is within the 12 nautical miles nung ating exclusive economic zone. Kaya yun ang problema. Kailangan ninyong may paliwanag mabuti ito. Ngayon, itong arbitral award did not say anything for China to do. Ang pinag-uusapan natin, yung occupancy niya. China claims most of the islands. Tayo nagka-claim din. Vietnam also claims. Malaysia also has a claim. Taiwan has a claim. There is no world body who will adjudicate kung sino talagang may-ari. So ito ngayon yung problema natin. Tama? May I explain, Your Honor? Uh, eh, tama ba? Okay. Uh, with respect to those rocks, yes, because the sovereignty over those rocks were never an issue before the arbitral tribunal. That being the case, the implication is that whoever is the de facto possessor at the moment, you maintain that status quo. So uh, that, that is the status. Hindi natin siya mapapaalis because the arbitral award didn't say that China leave those rocks or features. Tama? To that extent, you are correct, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yung Saudi Arabia Ambassador, uh, a few questions on it. Thank no, you very much. Mr. Chair, before, before we uh, call on the other uh, nominees, I think uh, Senator Risa. Yes, please. Also questions. for Ambassador Ben Surto, yes. Mr. Chair. Please proceed. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Maganda umaga po, Ambassador. Maganda po, ma'am. Yes. Um, so moving forward, Mr. Ambassador, also noting that um, country after country, parami ng parami yung uh, bilang na kumikilala ng ating tagumpay sa Hague Tribunal. Most recently, a whole formation uh, of NATO. What steps can be taken to ensure the wider recognition as an international norm? of our victory in the West Philippine Sea arbitration and perhaps, hopefully, its eventual implementation. So, uh, what steps can be taken to ensure that wider and wider recognition as an international norm? Uh, thank you, Your Honor, for the question. Uh, I think it's very important uh, for us to tell the world what exactly was the ruling. Uh, and it is very important for the international community to understand the legal and political implications of the ruling. Uh, if I may be more specific in that, in the past, whereas more than 500,000 square kilometers of Philippine exclusive economic zone and another five, more than 500,000 square kilometers of continental shelf, that's about a million, uh, uh, square kilometers of continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. Most of these now are no longer disputed because of the ruling. What, what used to be a large area of disputed is now just limited to something like 13,000 square kilometers. 13,000 square kilometers out of a million uh, square kilometers. What that means, therefore, is that it clarified the exclusive economic zone of the littoral countries. By that, I am, re I am referring to the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, and Vietnam. That being affirmed, the freedom of navigation is also affirmed. And therefore, what we have to tell the world is the wide range, far reaching implications of the South China Sea that it is more than a bilateral issue between the Philippines and China. The, the implication is far reaching in terms of the South China Sea with more than a third of global trade passing through. Some authors even put it at 60% uh, percent of total global trade. And therefore, the implications of that ruling includes both the literal state that I mentioned, the user states in terms of those countries 
that uses the South China Sea, but more than that, Your Honor, is the concept or the context of rule of law that after World War II, Your Honor, international relations have been galvanized and has kept the peace based on rule of law, and it is rule of law that that it is the bind that tie the tie that binds all of us in a community of nations. I think that message uh, should be put forward to the international community so that the international community can understand uh, the issue as more than a bilateral, but something that also has implications in the peace and security uh, on a global uh, basis, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ambassador. So we are talking here of peace and security more assured in a larger part uh, of the planet based on the rule of law. At saka, interesting din po, in terms of uh, magnitudes or proportions, hindi lang mathematically, but geopolitically as well, significant na 1 million square kilometers of the ocean in our region is no longer disputed compared with the remaining 13,000 square kilometers. And again, hindi lang po yan usapin ng mathematical or arithmetic, but geopolitically, it really means a lot for the peoples of our region and the peoples of the whole planet. Hindi lang tayo mga Pilipino. So it's a very important message that our country can share with the rest of the world. Yun po yung under isang understanding ko sa binahagin nyo sa amin. Salamat, Ambassador. Now, in light of China's continuing gray zone and salami slicing tactics in the West Philippine Sea, what measures can the Philippines take to protect our national interests and assert our rights? Are there diplomatic or legal uh, or other strategies within that space that can be employed to address these challenges? Thank you, Your Honor, for the question. I just want to make a disclaimer uh, at the very outset because I'm not part of the policy making at the moment in terms of that issue is concerned. And therefore, the opinion or the comments that I will put forward are principally my own opinion, and that uh, which is based on my previous engagement on the South China Sea. Uh, to answer your question, Your Honor, I would rather look at it contextually this way. I will have to look at my toolbox, Your Honor, and see what, uh, what are the tools available to me. And therefore, once I know what are the tools available to me, and those tools could mean multilateral, it could be bilateral, it could be internationalization, it could be minimum credible defense. What I'm saying, Your Honor, is, to, I, is that I have to be cre creative and apply those tools or a mix of policy tools uh, in every given situation with a clear objective of what exactly we want to achieve. Uh, obviously, everything will have to be within the parameters of peaceful settlement, and we have to therefore, in that context, see what is the appropriate tool that we can calibrate at any given moment of, of time. Uh, and I will not disregard any or either of, of those tools, but we'll simply have to understand how to calibrate and which tool would be appropriate at any given time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I think the image of a, a toolbox is very useful, very helpful, kahit po sa aming nagtatrabaho in that policy-making space that you referred to um, at the very start. And I appreciate yung sinabi niyong may iba't ibang tools talaga that used maybe in different calibrations at different moments can better in any given moment advance and protect uh, our national interest. And including through uh, cooperation between the executive and the legislature, and of course, uh, including in terms of cooperation among the different um, interested parties, tayo mga bansang nandirito, and the rest of the world, the other, the other uh, formations, the other uh, naval powers na interesado din sa rules-based approach dito sa conflicts na to. Uh, Mr. Chair, my last question for um, the Ambassador. Uh, given, yun na nga po, the complex nature of the West Philippine Sea issues, the dispute, how can the Philippines effectively engage with other nations, particularly those with vested interests as well in the region, to garner support for our stance and ensure that that rule of law you mentioned prevails? Uh, thank you, Your Honor, for the question. 
I think in deciding how, what to do here, we have to first and foremost look first at our own national interest because uh, at every given time, that would be the fundamental uh, 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 core principle that we have to take into account. But having said national interest, it's not enough that we mention national interest in its abstract concept. There has to be an effort on the part both of the executive and the legislative to somehow operationalize that in the context of the South China Sea. And what that means, therefore, is we have to have specific objectives at the end of the day. And once we are able to clarify ourselves exactly what we want to do there, then we can now think of the roadmap or the strategy on how to calibrate uh, certain tools in order to achieve those objectives. Once we're able to do that, we can put in the timeline in, and milestones in terms of what we want to achieve at a certain given time, all leading to the final objective or the goal that we have set for ourselves. And in that context, Your Honor, the, the internationalization or the ability to engage the international community is just one of the tools. It's not the end, uh, or, uh, end of everything, but rather is a, is a means and a tool that we have to take into account in relation to our national interest. What that means, therefore, Your Honor, there has to be a real discussion, engagement among all the concerned agencies to come up with those concrete policy steps. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ambassador. But of course, yung uh, engagement with other nations, uh, maybe also in certain moments, it may be the parang primus inter pares among our tools. And given nga how, not just how complex uh, the dispute is in the West Philippine or the whole South China Sea, literally and figuratively uh, fluid, napaka, uh, napaka um uh, importante po talaga. And of course, we have to presume na yung ibang mga bansa, iba't iba, they're also looking at their own toolboxes and fi figuring out how to use them. Uh, sometimes in a more friendly way with us, sometimes less so, pero, and that's where we count on the diplomatic corps to, to advise us ano yung best policy positions to take given yung what you, the diplomatic corps, can put into the, the problem solving uh, at any moment how we can identify common interests among the different national interests at any point in time to achieve that desired, not end state, kasi nga, fluid uh, for eternity na siguro. But in our time and in the time of our the generation of our children, the generation of our grandchildren, something hopefully that's getting uh, better and better over time. So maraming salamat po, uh, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think the Ambassador would like to uh, make another Thank point. you, Your Honor, for your comments. I completely agree with your observation. I think the events in the last 10 years have shown us how small the world is as a community, that when there is a situation on one part of the globe, that obviously will have implications on the other parts of the world. And so many years ago in 2011, when we first broke into the international scene within ASEAN and told, told the world essentially that what is at stake in the South China Sea is the concept of rule of law, we were telling the world that this is something that is of your interest because this is the tie that binds all of us in a community of nations. And when this very core principle of international law is broken in this part of the world, it will have implications on the other parts of the world. We are now seeing the implications of that as we look at the situation in Ukraine. Well, and so uh, just to, just to uh, put a period on that, Ma Madam Chair, I completely agree that we don't live as an island alone, but we live in a community. Uh, living in a community means we have to be able to interact, interrelate, uh, engage, dialogue uh, with other countries as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Salamat po, uh, Ambassador. Salamat po, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Risa. Before I call on Senator Go, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Congressman Greg Gasataya and Congressman J.J. Romualdo. Senator Bongo, you have the floor. Chair, Ms. Chair, Mr. Chair, meron lang akong ililinaw kasi masyadong general lang sagot mo eh. Medyo malinaw-linaw na ng konti, pinalabong mo pa eh. Halimbawa, yung Scarborough Shoal, Panatag Shoal or Scarborough Shoal is now occupied by China. So, it is entitled to 12 nautical miles, correct? You're correct, uh, Your Honor. And China is legally... Um, positioning some of its vessels 
in its, in its 12 nautical miles. Correct? Kung maglagay siya ng vessels doon, pwede niyang gawin because it occupies Scarborough Shoal. Your Honor, I, I, with all your, with all due respect, Your Honor, and your indulgence, I, that China can do what it thinks is right on what, the Scarborough Shoal. Whatever it pleases, pwede siya maglagay ng barko ng, ano, because it is entitled to 12 nautical miles as it occupies that particular island. Tama? I did not use the word legally, Your Honor, because we claim that area, and therefore I would be hesitant to use legally, because what is uh, legal... Are you saying that China cannot legally occupy or enjoy the 12 nautical miles of the Scarborough Shoal? Our position, Your Honor, is that they don't, because we also claim that, and they actually took it. No, 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 no. In public international law, anyone which occupies an island enjoys the 12 nautical miles and also the separate exclusive economic zone. That is plain fact and simple. Your Honor, I, again, with all due respect, they may have a de, fa de facto possession, but they don't have the de jure right over that place and that's Mr. Ben Surto, we're not talking here of de facto and de jure. What is factual is that China is the occupant of the Scarborough Shoal. And under public international law, anyone who occupies that can enjoy the maritime rights surrounding that island. This is basic. So kung yung mga barko niya nandun sa 12 nautical miles which happens to intersect with our exclusive economic zone, doon nagkakaroon tayo ng problema. Now you're talking about toll boxes. What does Article 123 of UNCLOS say about the South China Sea? Article 123 or 121 of UNCLOS? 123. Because uh, 121 is the more appropriate uh, uh, article, Your Honor, because it speaks of the three kinds or classes of uh, features or islands, quote unquote. The first category is the naturally formed islands, which if they are... But I am not talking about 123. Why, why are you insisting that? 121. I'm talking about 123. Are you familiar with that? Uh, Your Honor, with all humility, I am not aware at the moment of Article 123, but usually it's Article 110. But I understand your point, Your Honor, but uh, I we never look at 123 because uh, we don't see the significance of that. in relation You do not see the significance of Article 123 of the UNCLOS. 123 says about the kind of sea. It talks about an enclosed or semi-enclosed sea. The South China Sea is a semi-enclosed sea. What is the significance of that? Hindi mo alam. Uh, in so far as a semi-enclosed sea, Your Honor, the South China Sea is a semi-enclosed sea. Yes, what is the significance of that? Because we were talking of the toolbox. Kasi kung deliberately in ignore ninyo yan, you're ignoring the most important a tool in your toolbox. Kasi yung sinasabi dyan, if it is a semi-enclosed sea, the coastal estates surrounding that maritime area should cooperate, should collaborate, or coordinate in the exploration, exploitation, management, and blah, blah, blah of the resources in that particular sea. So we can maximize that. Isa sa magandang toolbox sana yung uh, naisip ko na dapat yun ang ipurso ninyo. Even the arbitral award says something about the Scarborough Shoal, sabi nung award, is a traditional fishing ground for China, the Philippines, and even Vietnam. What is the significance of that in your toolbox? If it is held by the arbitral award as a fishing ground, then we can pursue that particular concept. You can shift the concept from talking about sovereignty, which is held by the state, or talking about private rights, which is traditional fishing rights. Wala sana tayong problema sa fishermen if you pursue that. That is one of those import, important tools in your toolbox. Is it correct? Thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, may I uh, 
Sige. Okay na yun. Kaya kailangan maklarify natin para hindi tayo nagkakaroon ng problema. Uh, the first point, Your Honor, in a semi-enclosed sea in relation to part Tapos nine. na. Tapos na. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm Teresa. I just want to uh, maybe not pose a question uh, to the ambassador but raise a point. Something that uh, I'm wondering about. I, I, at hindi ko po hinahanap masettle ngayon but just to, to think about Think aloud about it bilang member ng legislature. Maybe something na pwede namin hinga ng guidance sa inyo sa, sa diplomatic or uh, moving forward. Uh, perhaps in the sea, as much as on land, uh, uh, possession is not ownership. Um, I don't believe that might is right. Gusto ko rin po ng rule of law. Hindi po ako, ako abogado. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm interested in rule of law. And um, siguro kung one literally sea change sa international relations was the formation of the United Nations, arguably sea change din yung ating uh, victory sa Hague Tribunal. Siguro nung panahon pa lang ng gunboat diplomacy, might was right. You know, you could steam into ano bang bay dun sa Japan and threaten her with your with your gunboats and you usher in a new era in that, in that country. So ng ngayon tuloy, dahil sa interpellations, na napaiisip nga ako, oo nga, kung meron na tayong karapatan recognized by the tribunal, recognized by more and more countries, recognized by more and more regional formations around the world, kahit pa may ibang mga bansa dyan who occupy rocks, non-islands, sa kinilalang exclusive economic zone natin sa West Philippine Sea. I don't know. It makes me wonder. Baka lalong nagsosolidify na though they occupied that, they don't, though they, they claim they possess it under some numbered line, but the right belongs with our country. And I'm also trying to figure out how over time not just in law, but in reality on the ground or on the water, ma-uphold yon. Na yung mayroong exclusive economic zone, kahit pa may mga pockets of uh, areas generated by mere rocks, by uh, earlier military actions by those other nations, and eventually, kaya ko, dun sa unang tanong ko, I talked about eventual implementation, eventually ma-uphold yung karapatan natin, as we are prepared to do in the areas that are their exclusive economic zones. So, hindi tayo manghihimasok sa kanila, mag occupy ng rock nila, and then to generate kung anumang uh, area within their uh, parts of the ocean. So, just thinking aloud, uh, Ambassador, and moving forward, uh, hoping na hindi lang tayo, all countries, China, all the other countries in, in the South China Sea, magkaroon ng clarity at understanding at mutual respect dyan. Salamat, Ambassador. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Senator Riza, Senator Bongo, you have the floor. Salamat, uh, Mr. Chair. As uh, Vice Chair of the Committee on uh, Foreign Affairs, just want to uh, manifest uh, for the record that I support the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs, the DFA plays a crucial role in uh, representing the interests of the Philippines on the global stage, protecting the welfare of Filipino citizens and advancing our nation's diplomatic objectives. The employees of the DFA are the backbone of a very critical work. Alam niyo po yun. In fact, Mr. Chair, I filed in the Senate Senate Bill 1706 or the Proposed Foreign Retirement and Disability Benefits Act. Bill pa po ito, if enacted into law, this will not only benefit the newly retired DFA officers and employees, but also those who retired prior to the effectivity of the act since the measure is retroactive. At itong proposal na ito ay galing po sa inyo. This bill seeks to increase the monthly pension and disability benefits of retirees of the Department of Foreign Affairs to be at par with the current pay scale enjoyed by those in active service. We're also providing survivorship benefits to qualified dependents. This is a testament of support to the DFA. 
Sabi ko nga, kahit deal pa lang po ito, sana po ay masuportahan po ito ng mga kasamahan ko sa Kongreso, sa Senado. Always po akong full support sa ating mga foreign affairs officials and employees, including ambassadors and consuls. Having said that, Mr. Chair, in the interest of advancing the rights and welfare of our countrymen abroad, I would like to profound some questions to our appointees today para po ito sa kapakanan ng ating mga OFWs na nagsasakripisyo sa ibang bansa at napakahirap pong mapalayo sa ating pamilya. Hindi po nababayaran ng kahit ano yung lungkot na mapalayo sa ating mga pamilya. Kaya kailangan lang po nila magtrabaho sa abroad dahil may, may padala po sila sa kanilang mga pamilya. My general questions to our ambassadors would be, kaya niyo bang ipaglaban ang kapakanan ng mga Pilipino abroad, lalong-lalo na po yung mga OFWs? Willing ba kayo na ibigay po ang number ninyo para makontak kayo ng mga kababayan natin kung saan mang kayo ma-appoint? 24 hours on call ba kayo? Approachable ba kayo? O reachable? Lalo na po sa mga ordinaryong kababayan natin na nasa ibang bansa, napaka-importante po ang public relations sa public service. Dapat po bukas ang ating opisina sa mga ordinaryong Pilipino o sa mga OFWs, lalo na po yung mga kababayan nating walang matakbuhan, yung mga helpless, hopeless, na minsan po ay nananawagan na lang sa Facebook, sa radyo, at walang matakbuhan. Ah, uh, alam ko naman po at alam nyo na hindi po kayo pumunta sa abroad para mamasyal at asakusuhin lang po yung mga bisita. Kung hindi, dapat po ay bukas po ang inyong opisina para sa ordinaryong mamamayang Pilipino at yung mga OFWs natin na wala pong matakbuhan kung hindi tayo nasa gobyerno. Yun lang po ang aking uh, paalala. Full support naman po ako parati dito sa inyo sa ambassadors, consuls, down sa mga nag uh, kinukumpirma rito. Meron lang po akong mga konting katanungan po tungkol dito sa Turkey, Georgia at uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, after the recent uh, earthquake, ilan po ba sa mga OFW na naiwan sa Turkey How, how are we helping them uh, cope uh, with, the with the tragedy? What are the steps being undertaken to assist our OFWs who are affected by the earthquake and for those who are uh, residing uh, there? At ano na po yung update sa mga repatriation efforts for our, of our OFWs who wish to come home uh, na kompleto na po ba ito? Thank you, Your Honor, for your questions. Uh, first, Your Honor, I, uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, we just want to confirm uh, the mandate that you have just uh, elaborated on. And we are with you, uh, Your Honor, in terms of helping our kababayan. And this is not just a mandate, but from our perspective, this is something that is right. Uh, and therefore, we take this very seriously. With that, uh, Your Honor, to your question with respect to the Filipinos in Turkey, indeed, uh, many Filipinos, several uh, families have been have been affected by the tragic uh, uh, earthquake in Turkey. The embassy had uh, to get, uh, first. We sent a team uh, to provide uh, help to to the country. About 80 of our rescuers, uh, combined elements from various uh, rescue institutions, uh, went there to provide that help to Turkey. Uh, second, in terms of our fellow Filipinos, uh, we have something like 5,000 uh, Filipinos in Turkey scattered all over, and some of them have been affected on the southern part. Uh, what we did, Your Honor, our embassy there went around and then uh, gathered those who were directly impacted and uh, allowed the embassy, in fact, even uh, to house them and and. Uh, and also got some houses uh, as temporary shelters for our fellow Filipinos. And then uh, from there, they kind of, uh, they took a survey of who would like to be repatriated because not all of them, your owner, wanted to go home, but a significant, a large number of that had already been repatriated uh, 
here back in the Philippines, Your Honor. And I suppose at some point in time when things get normalized, they may uh, wish to go back again. But for those who have been uh, left behind, Your Honor, we continue to provide shelter for them uh, to the extent that we can. And as the Turkish government also provides housing now, uh, slowly we make representations with the government of Turkey to also uh, uh, take into account the Filipinos who have been uh, displaced by the earthquake. Thank you, Your Honor. Salamat, Ambassador. What do you... Uh... What do you think is the most uh, significant uh, uh, to you? What is the most significant ge geopolitical uh, development uh, affecting Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, and what is the what is this uh, of uh, primal importance uh, to the Philippines? What is the effect of this to the Filipinos there? Assuming a uh, worst case uh, scenario. What would be your concrete uh, recommendations uh, in the event of uh, uh, civil uh, strife or instability in uh, Turkey? Do you have uh, concrete experience in assistance uh, in, to nationals or in the crisis uh, or humanitarian situations? Thank you, Your Honor. If I may answer the last question first, uh, in terms of my ex personal experience, I was uh, my first experience as a junior officer was the floor contemplation, uh, and uh, I was part of that. Uh, meaning to say, I went there when we broke our diplomatic relations because we did. As a consequence of that, of that incident, we broke diplomatic relations, and so we recalled all our diplomats. But we could not let uh, the more than 200 Filipinos by themselves, and so it was still very important that we have representations, if only for the purpose of taking care of our Filipinos. And so I was there for about six months as an as a single officer to take care of the uh, welfare of our more than. 200 Filipinos. Anong, anong taon po yun nangyari yun? I think this was sometime in 93 or 94, Your Honor. Napanood ko yun sa uh, pelikula. Nandun ka ba nun sa pelikula? Uh, I was not part of the core officers at the embassy. I came in, Your Honor, uh, as part of the DFA team uh, that uh, represented the DFA in the Gankaiko Commission. And so part of the team also to understand exactly what happened. And when we broke off diplomatic relations, it was decided by the secretary at, uh, during that time that even if we don't have diplomatic relations, we cannot abandon the more than 200 Filipinos there. And so it became, it became a policy, therefore, of the department at that time to send two officers, myself and um, the late Ambassador Licaros, to immediately proceed and take care of our Filipinos, Your Honor. And uh, I must tell you that uh, when I was there for the entire six months, uh, it was uh, seven, uh, seven, seven days and 24 hours. Uh, that was, and it was good that I was young <laughs> because uh, I, I was reporting as early as 6.30 and go home around 2 a.m. That was, that was the rotation on a daily basis, Your Honor. So, ibig sabihin na Ambassador, masipag po kayo. Ilang taon na ako kayo sa, uh, sa, sa servisyo? As a career po kayo, sir, no? Yes, Your Honor. I've been with the department for a, for about 30 years na po. 30 years. So, ma may papangako mo ba na uh, approachable po kayo sa ating mga kababayan sa abroad, lalong-lalo na po sa mga ordinaryong mga Pilipino na doon? I, I think this should not only be a matter of obligation, but every officer who goes out must take this to heart. Uh, it is something that it will have to be like a, a, a bit of our heart, uh, and we must take this as a natural consequence, uh, essentially, because if you don't love this job, it will be very, very difficult on our part. And so we have to love this job. We have to love our fellow Kababayans. We have to love doing good for all of them. And we must be happy every time we are able to help them. Thank Ambassador, you. can you make your answers briefly? Kasi habang humahaba ang mga sagot mo, hahaba din yung mga tanong namin. At uh, puyat na kami dito. Sige na. May apologies, Mr. Chair. Marami pa akong 
tanong sir, makapal po ito. O nakita mo na. Second lang po ako kay uh, Congressman uh, Marcoleta, sir. Uh, what are the most uh, significant cases against uh, Filipinos uh, in jail in uh, Turkey po, uh, sir, sa ngayon? Your Honor, well, nothing of that significance, but if I may, yung mga ano lang po, yung mga illegal, uh, undocumented, uh, so when when they don't have appropriate documentation, then they become a target for law enforcement. Uh, outside of that po, uh, hindi naman uh, ganon for now, but as the number of Filipinos grow, uh, that may be possible, Your Honor. <laughs> Salamat. Uh, Naasay na po kayo doon before? Anong taon po? Uh, this is my first first year. And uh, ilang ilang Filipino communities na po ang nasa Turkey ngayon, sir? Uh, there are about 5,000 po and about 400 of that are illegal, il uh, undocumented. Undocumented. Oh. So yun lang po, ma matulungan natin sila. Lalong lalo na yung mga uh, mag-guided po sila ng maayos. Maraming uh, salamat po. Balikan ko lang po mamaya yung iba. <laughs> okay, maraming salamat. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Bongo. Uh, Congressman Jay Padiernos, uh, uh, do you have any man manifestation? No, tapos na. Eh, yung iba mamaya pa. Go ahead po. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, good morning, my distinguished colleagues in the Commission's on Appointment. Good morning. On behalf of GP Party List and myself, uh, it is my honor to manifest my general support for the confirmation by this Honorable Commission of the nomination of all our DFA nominees, namely Maria Angela Abrera Ponce, Joselle Francisco Ignacio, Henry Sikat Bensurto Jr., Paul Raymond Pasion Cortez, Carlos Deimec Soreta, Renato Pedro Oabel Villa, and at last but not the least, I'd like to give a special mention to one of my good friends, marami po akong utang na loob nat dito sa tao na to. Napakagaling po nito. Uh, Ambassador Raul Salabaria Hernandez. Thank you for all of you for representing our country with pride and honor, your respective accomplishment, and ultimately your diplomatic skills strong work ethics and dedication to service have resulted to each of you no earn your responsible your respectable and well-deserved positions within the department of foreign affairs thus it is my great honor that i manifest my support for the confirmation of the nomination of all dfa official before us today thank you mr chair Thank you, Congressman uh, GP. Congressman Johnny Pimentel. Wala na yata. Oh, nakatulog. Congressman Pimentel, are you still with us? Okay, never mind. All right, uh, you are now excused. Uh, ambas oh, Congressman Segurbaria. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to uh, one question to uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Ben Suerto, Jr. Ambassador, this is for my own personal consumption. Do you have any idea if there are some, some heirs of the Osman family who used to rule Turkey under the Ottoman Empire for, for the longest time? Are they still there? Do you have any knowledge? I have a little knowledge, Your Honor. They are still uh, there. And the descendants, uh, descendants are yes. still influential, 
but I think uh, their influence uh, uh, has been uh, not to the same level and extent as it was in the past, Your Honor, but they're still a very influential uh, political family, Your Honor. Okay, thank you very much. And another, Mr. Chair, it's just a manifestation of full support to all the nominees no, on the respected posts coming from the Department of Foreign Affairs. So that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Sagarbari. You are now excused, the Ambassador uh, Binsurto. Chair, uh, may, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, may I call on uh, Mr. Raul Sal Salavaria Hernandez to take your... Uh, Please take your designated seat. Are you now ready to respond to questions coming from this uh, commission, uh, Ambassador Hernandez? Yes, Sir Albert Are Chairman you? and Your Honors. Any of uh, the members who wishes to Propound questions to the nominee. Uh, Senator Go. Okay. All right. You are now excused. Thank you very much, sir. May I call on Mr. Renato Pedro Abelvilla, Ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. You are you now ready to answer questions coming from this uh, body? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Any of uh, the members who wish to ask questions? Mr. Chair. Uh, Congressman Marcoleta. Ambassador Bilia, will you please give us an update as to what happened to uh, the claims for back wages of uh, some 12,000 uh, migrant Filipino workers? I think uh, there was a pledge to pay them. Um, the average uh, payment ranges from 1,500 to 2,000 US dollars. And considering that 12,000 Filipino migrant workers were supposed to be paid, that will be about a billion pesos. We would like to receive updates, Mr. Ambassador, whether or not the payment of back wages has been uh, has been done. As of this time, uh, Your Honor, um, it has not been affected. But when uh, the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman and President Marcos met at the sidelines of uh, APEC in in Thailand, uh, one of the pledges made by the Crown Prince is to pay the back wages of the Filipino workers because it has been pending since 2014. So um, arrangements has been made with the ministers, Minister of Labor of Saudi Arabia to effect the mechanism to pay the, the in fact, the, the pledge was 1 billion US dollars, Your Honor. So I hope to have a, a part of the uh, of settling the the back wages, Your Honor, when when I have I when I will have the honor to be confirmed. Thank you. So, w when was the pledge made? Uh, during the meeting last year between President Marcos and uh, uh, the crowd. It is only a pledge. Up to now, the payment has not been affected. Not correct? yet affected, but uh, the mechanism, as I mentioned, to to effect the payment is ongoing. What is the status of that mechanism, Ambassador? Uh, the um, uh, Secretary uh, Tutsople went just recently to Saudi Arabia to start uh, the, the talks with, uh, with the concerned Saudi officials. Mr. Ambassador, I think one way to pressure the Kingdom of Saudi Arab Arabia to make good that pledge is to tell them or to insinuate to their government that the Philippines is ready to withdraw its support for its potential hosting of the 30th World Expo. And in withdrawing that, we will probably ship our support to uh, 
to our ASEAN neighbor, South Korea, because I think Busan is also pushing to host the 30th World Expo. What do you say? Um, I think uh, we should uh, do this discreetly because it may... Uh, Bakit naman may... pa discreet? Discreet pa eh. <laughs> One billion ang kanilang pledge. Yes. Kawawa yung mga migrant workers uh, dahil ba tumiklop ang kanilang mga kumpanya eh, hindi, hindi nila babayaran ang pinagtrabuhan ng ating mga kapapayan. Yeah. And we have another um, so-called uh, uh, pressure point to, to Saudi Arabia because they wish to be uh, to have uh, to accede to the ASEAN uh, uh, TAC, and so we, we can use this to uh, to sort of pressure them. Kaya nga, the, the best pressure point. Don't, don't mean word anymore. Kailangan sabihin natin, babayaran mo ba o hindi or we will withdraw our support. We will ship our support to South uh, Korea instead. Alam ko naman, diplomat ka. You can do it diplomatically but not discreetly kasi kailangan mabayaran po sila, Mr. Ambassador. Diba? I will do my best, uh, Your Honor. Kasi naman, uh, yung dati nating uh, Secretary of... Uh, Foreign Affairs, ngayon ay ambassador na yata sa United Kingdom. Eh bakit naman kasi sinabi niya kagad, we are voting for uh, Saudi Arabia, we are rooting for Saudi Arabia to host the 30th World Expo. Can we, can we change that? Can we withdraw that? As I said, uh, Your Honor, uh, we have to take into consideration our uh, national interest uh, in the Middle East, primarily with Saudi Arabia, and uh, it consists of the three O's, main, uh, that is oil, overseas Filipino workers, where we have more than 830,000, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. So, we yeah, must... you will have to do a very delicate balancing act. Yes, and in, the, in balancing this, you should consider the one billion pesos pledged by no less than the crown prince, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mr. Ambassador. Yes. Okay, lang ba sa yun? Uh, we will do that, Your Honor. But as uh, you mentioned, diplomatically. Mr. Chairman, hindi nakikinig yun. Okay, Mr. Chair, oh, wala na pong... Basta, Mr. Ambassador, ha? diplomatically but forcefully. Pwede ba yun? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Congressman Marcolete. And I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Assistant Majority Floor Leader, Senator Joseph Victor Ejercita. Oh, doon ka na ro. Lipat na ro yung kapatid ko dyan. Sempre blood is thicker than water. Ay, Guzman uh, Sagarbaria, oh, lipat ka na rito. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, recently I read, I read in the newspapers that uh, Saudi Arabia would be needing no less than 1 million uh, Filipino overseas workers. Can you confirm this? Uh, in fact, uh, during the meeting again between pr the President Marcos and the uh, Crown Prince in uh, during the sidelines of the APEC in Thailand, uh, the Crown Prince mentioned that they are building this uh, humongous tech, tech city and they would need uh, services of um, not a million, perhaps uh, uh, more than 500,000 Filipino technical or skilled workers. So, madadagdagan po yung ating mga OFW sa Saudi Arabia. So, meaning to say, as of now, wala mayon. Not yet. Not yet there. We are still in the process because that word that you use, humongous project that they are going into, has not started yet or has already been starting. But yeah, it already started already and we are now deploying more or less Overseas contract workers, no? In my my groundbreaking, uh, Your Honor. 
So has, so, he, has this been disseminated to our people who would be interested to work in Saudi Arabia? I think the Department of Migrant Workers uh, is the one in is, charge. Is the one in charge, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Congressman Sargarbaria. Any other uh, members? Who, uh, Senator Go. Uh, Ambassador, uh, what uh, steps will you be sure to take uh, to ensure that our OFWs are not uh, treated like uh, slaves uh, by their foreign employers? Di ba narin na assigned po kayo sa Davao? Sa, uh, sa ngayon, sa ngayon sir, naka-assign po ako sa DFA Mindanao, Davao City. So narinig niyo po yung sinasabi ni former President uh, Duterte about uh, my experiences po ng ating uh, OFW sa uh, sa ibang sa Middle East. Uh, na, na, are you aware? Na, narinig niyo po? Napakinggan ko ano? po si President Duterte. So, uh, kaya nga tinatanong kita, ano po yung uh, steps na gagawin niyo to ensure that our OFWs are not treated like slaves by their foreign employees? Are there uh, safe houses uh, provided for our OFWs uh, who are abused? At uh, what concrete steps will you take in order to uh, address this issue? Uh, mula pa po nung na-assign ako sa nung first assignment ko sa Abu Dhabi. At uh, ang aking binabanggit ko po sa Filipino community, Filipino community organizations, na bilang... Uh, isa na ring eight assistance to national officer ay follow an open door policy. So kung sino man po ang mga distressed Filipino ay makakalapit po sa aking opisina. Kahit na po ako ay nag-ambassador na doon sa Kuwait, yun rin po ang sinabi ko na open door, anyone of you can 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 come to my office. And uh, in, uh, uh, acting agad tutugunan ang mga pangangailangan nila. So for the record po yan, uh, can you submit your action uh, plan? Uh, on on behalf of the overseas uh, Filipino workers, sir. Yes. yes, sir. In fact, I have, um, when I was uh, assigned or, or uh, designated as ambassador to Kuwait, and when I was there, there was a lot of problems regarding our domestic workers. So I have, um, I made up a short, paper on on the steps to be taken to to ensure their protection uh, about the ito po mga OFWs natin sa death row uh, can you can you kindly provide this committee with the most uh, uh, recent uh, statistics or an estimate of of the number of OFWs currently on uh, death row Um, ang alam ko lang po yung nasa yung sa Saudi Arabia meron po tayong uh, limang uh, death penalty cases at uh, all uh, uh, ano po ang kaso nila murder and uh, nagkaroon na po ng final judgment and so under Sharia law ang ating final resort na lang is to is to uh, plead with the family for forgiveness and for them to accept blood money. blood money. So we will continue our negotiations with the families of the victims. Y yan po ang naging uh, issue. No? Meron po akong maalala na natulungan ko na yun nga, uh, inubliga po siyang magbigay ng uh, blood money. Uh, pag mga ganitong cases, uh, what are the measures and initiatives uh, undertaken by the Department of Foreign Affairs to support and assist uh, OFWs uh, who face legal challenges or uh, violations for our cases? Of course, uh, meron po tayong uh, legal assistance fund and we provide the lawyer for, for, the, for the Filipinos. And um, ang isa pong challenge lang ay hindi po pwedeng uh, mag-allocate ng blood money for, for, the de for payment of... Uh, that uh, yung ano blood money for for the victims nakukunin dun sa assistance to national fund so we appeal to fellow kababayans na medyo may kaya to share in the payment of the blood money meron po akong naalala na natulungan ko rin pong may nag-sponsor na isang uh, 
Good Samaritan, siya po nagbayad ng ng Danios ng blood money. Ngayon nakauwi na po yung uh, kababayan nating OFW. At uh, another case naman po yung sa sa Bahrain, no? Yung uh, si Polycarpio. Sino yung sa nagtatrabaho sa PPA? Ganun rin po nakasuhan, nag-apilar po si Pangul dating Pangulong Duterte sa sa sa, sa kanilang uh, king. na binaba po yung sentensya to life and then nag-apila uli at uh, nabigyan po siya ng uh, ng pardon na kauwi siya natulungan ko rin pong magtrabaho uh, dito yun po yung sa Bahrain iba naman po yung tinulungan sa blood money uh, anyway uh, are there uh, partnerships or collaborations with legal organizations or pro bono services to ensure access to legal representation po Uh, Doon po sa Saudi Arabia ay wala pong gano'n na mag, we can avail of uh, pro bono services. So we have to um, to assess yung, uh, yung mga, mga qualification ng lawyers, yung kanilang track record. Kung maganda naman, I think meron na tayong nakuhang mga retainer doon sa Saudi Arabia, sir, to assist our OFWs in legal cases. Ito naman po mga undocumented OFWs. Uh, do we have the statistics of uh, undocumented uh, OFWs? Could you please furnish this committee the actual numbers uh, for uh, those uh, uh, undocumented OFWs who chose to return uh, uh, to the Philippines voluntarily or uh, repatriated? Uh, are there reintegration programs or uh, initiatives available to help them reintegrate uh, into society? At tungkol po dun sa mga undocumented workers or runaway, uh, mag, nag, we also face challenges in repatriating them. Gawa po nung tinatawag na kafala system or sponsorship system na, na mamayani sa Middle East, na kung hindi pumapayag yung, employ, yung previous or current employer na pauwiin sila o mag-file ng kaso yung, yung employer na yon laban sa ano, kahit, kahit uh, manufactured case, sabihin nagnakaw, ay um, mabagal yung pagproseso po. Ngunit uh, nakatutok po tayo, pati yung mga kinuha nating abogado, para ma mapabilis yung pag-uwi nila. Malik ka uh, darimbang pala. Yun ang natulungan ko po sa Saudi Arabia na... Uh, nakabangga ng Pakistani sa Saudi Arabia, natulungan ko po ng blood money. Nakauwi na po siya. At iba naman yung sa Bahrain, si Aguinaldo. Uh, yun po yung na-pardon na po. Anyway, going back to your work, uh, how does the Department of Foreign Affairs work with other government agencies for the protection of undocumented OFWs from potential uh, abuse or Uh, maltreatment po. Sa mga 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 lugar na may mala, maraming OFW, ay meron po tayong ano Philippine Overseas Labor Office na ngayon ay sakup na nga ng Dep Department of Migrant Workers at uh, nagtutulungan tayo na sa kanila uh, meron tayong tinatawag na one country team approach na para ma, ma matutukan yung mga kaso nila. Ito pong, babagitin ko na lang po, sir, no? Ito pong Department of Migrant Workers, ito po yung isinulong natin nung 18 Congress, uh, pirmahan po ni dating Pangulong Duterte. Dahil na, napansin ko talaga nun, sir, walang isang departamentong nakatutok sa kanila. Yung minsan nananawagan po sa radyo, television, sa Facebook, humihingi ng uh, tulong. Finally po, with the help of uh, my fellow legislators po sa 18 Congress, na isa batas na po ito at meron na tayong isang departamento na para po sa ating mga migrant workers or OFWs o mga tinatawag nating mga modern day uh, heroes para po ito sa, sa kanila. Salamat po, uh, Ambassador uh, Villa. Thank you, uh, Senator Go. You're now excused, uh, Ambassador... Dagang salamat po. Ambassador uh, Villa. May Next, may call on Maria Ang Angela Ponce. Ambassador to Malaysia. 
Yeah, good morning. Are you ready honors. to answer questions uh, from the body, uh, Ambassador? Ambassador, are you ready to answer questions? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Any other members who wishes to ask questions? Uh, okay, you're now excused, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. I would like to call on uh, Ambassador Paul Raymond Pasion Cortes, Ambassador to the Portuguese Republic. Ready, uh, Ambassador? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Any other members who wish to ask question? <laughs> Ambassador Mercoleta. Mr. Chair, I would like to ask... Sorry, you... Congressman Mercoleta, I'm sorry. What is the capital of Portugal, Ambassador? This one, Your Honor. And uh, Ferdinand Magellan is a Portuguese. Yes, Your Honor. He was the one who responsible for the rediscovery of our country under the flag of Spain. Yes, Your Honor. Pagka ba pumupunta ka ng Portugal, kailangan eh, nakarating ka muna ng Madrid or hindi naman kailangan? Hindi naman po kailangan. Uh, kasi si Chairman, pinatatanong niya ito. Eh. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman Marcoleta. Any other uh, members of this body who wishes to ask questions? You're now excused, uh, Ambassador uh, Cortez. Next in line is uh, Ambassador Josel Francisco Ignacio. Ambassador to the Republic of India. Ready, Mag Ambassador? Magandang umaga po. Ready po. Handa right. po tayo. Magandang Any uh, members who wish to ask question? Good luck sa India. <laughs> Maraming salamat po, Mr. Right. Chairman. You're now excused. Maraming salamat. Last but not the least, Ambassador Carlos Soreta. Permanent, represent permanent representative of the Republic of the Philippines to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. Ready, Ambassador? Yes, Mr. Chair. All Thank right. you. Senator Risa is recognized. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Maganda umaga po, Ambassador. I just have one, uh, or rather, a couple of policy questions uh, about one topic. Ambassador, the Supreme Court earlier this year declared unconstitutional and void the joint marine seismic un undertaking entered into by the Philippine National Oil Company, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation, and the Vietnam Oil and Gas Corporation signed in 2005 involving an area in the South China Sea within the country's exclusive economic zone covering 142,886 square kilometers. The court held that seismic surveying constituted exploration as contemplated in Section 2, Article 12 of the 1987 Constitution, which provides that the exploration, development, and utilization of natural resources shall be under the full control and supervision of the state. The court also held that because the JMSU was neither a financial and technical assistance agreement nor a service contract, it did not comply with the requirements of the Constitution. To quote the Supreme Court, quote, the JMSU is unconstitutional for allowing wholly owned foreign corporations to participate in the exploration of the country's natural resources without observing the safeguards provided in Section 2, Article 12 of the 1987 Constitution. Earlier this month, Ambassador, you stated that the Supreme Court's interpretation of national territory as used in the Constitution will negatively impact our country's exploration activities. You said that, and I quote, it is generally accepted that EEZ is not national territory, but the Supreme Court has upheld the literal description of national territory, which ties our hands now to engage 
not only to be able to tap the resources with others, but has stopped us in the confidence building measure of building further cooperation, close quote. You were also of the opinion, Ambassador, that the decision would have the effect of excluding us from cooperating with other countries to benefit from the energy resources in disputed territory, saying, quote, it has far-reaching implications. Based on the Supreme Court decision, other countries, other countries can now go into cooperative endeavors and exclude us. And the irony there is it is because of that decision, close quote. So just to clarify your position, Ambassador, uh, were you saying, are you saying that Section 2, Article 12 of the 1987 Constitution does not apply to our EEZ? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Your Honor, what I was saying, yes, we have uh, filed an appeal. Uh, the government has filed an appeal. So essentially, we are disputing the, the decision, ma'am. And so it is pending now. Yes, I'm, I'm not trying to um, violate any sub judice rule, but just in, in your opinion as our ambassador, uh, are you saying that uh, in our EEZ, this particular section of our constitution does not apply? What I was saying is that um, based on a 2011 Supreme Court decision, uh, Magaliana versus Executive Secretary, the uh, attempt to harmonize our obligations under UNCLOS and our Constitution has, uh, there was a landmark decision that said that we must respect our uh, international obligations and interpret in such a way that it harmonizes with our uh, Constitution. The EEZ concept in our Constitution, when it was included, by the uh, drafters of the constitution, it's not an abstract concept they just plucked from the air. They took it from the UNCLOS and their intent was to institutionalize it in the constitution. But what happened was they interpreted the EEZ as national territory. And in article one, that's the way they interpreted it. And article one defines it uh, for the whole constitution. So every time EEZ is mentioned, it has to refer to that definition. What we were, we were trying to do is um, allow us um, the UNCLOS definition, which is not a territorial uh, approach. Literally, Article 12, Section 2 does say, if you read it by itself, that it should be total control as if it's territory. Um, but we are disputing that because the strategy has been since the 90s was to build cooperation and confidence in the region so that we can achieve an atmosphere where we can one day sit down and discuss our differences. So we started out starting in 92, cooperating in what's called non-resource based cooperation. So marine safety, environment, uh, transnational crimes in the South China Sea, search and rescue. And then by 2005, we felt that it would it's the right time uh, at that time, um, conflict wasn't as hot as it is now. We felt that it was the time that we could move on to resource-based cooperation, hopefully to avoid the situation we have now where the tensions are very high because of the hardening of positions of all sides. So that was the strategy. We, ha we hope to continue that, uh, Mr. Chair, because the flip side of cooperation is conflict and confrontation. So we were trying to develop uh, this sense of uh, trust and understanding and co confidence and cooperation in, in the South China Sea. And so that strategy uh, was a bit, uh, was, was thrown off track. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, our motion for reconsideration would, would succeed and we would be allowed to work with others in disputed areas to show that we can cooperate. And then one day sit down and, and talk about settling issues in a more a longer and more meaningful manner. Honestly, Ambassador, I'm not yet sure if uh, I wish you luck in the case, um, because it's, it's really a very important question you have put to the Supreme Court. Yes. Siyempre po siguro yung mga resource-based cooperation or resource-based relationships, whatever the tenor, maybe by nature will really be more 
uh, complicated and potentially conflictual than uh, non-resource-based um, cooperation. And I also wonder if uh, hindi kaya yung or did it not seem uh, to you or to government when it filed the case na yung uh, tagumpay natin sa Hague Tribunal would have clarified uh, this question, maybe validating the, the constitutional uh, mandate um, on this question of of EEC and uh, national territory. But just just for the record, just so I understand clearly clearly uh, what you're saying, Ambassador. So you're saying that Section 2 of the Constitution should not apply to the EEC. Is that what the case is saying? We are saying that the interpret... If it's the arbitration we're talking about, the arbitration says that area is EEZ. It is not, uh, it's not national territory. If you use the arbitration as basis for argument as to Article 12, Section 2, it's EEZ. It's not national territory. And therefore, we, it's, not, uh, we, it's not to be treated as uh, absolute control, the same way we would have over land or, or the territorial sea. Um, yes, ma'am, you point out a good point. The arbitration says this is, and that's why it's so important. The arbitration actually lays the basis for the countries to finally agree. The arbitration says this is the definition of your entitlements, depending on how you count it from your baselines, and there will be overlaps, and it's up to us to uh, try to discuss and, and delimit it. There are no land features that should be generating EEZs in that area. The most would be uh, territorial sea. But then that's the basis for negotiation. That's at least the legal principles for one day we might be able to sit, sit down like in other places in the world where we can delimit our differences. I don't know if you are uh, being an ultimate diplomat right now, but I somehow sense that you're evading the question or evading uh, answering it um, directly. If there, if there were uh, two goods being given uh, to the Philippines. If the Constitution says uh, this is EEZ, and if in the interpretation of government, the arbitrary ruling is saying something else or something less, uh, kami as legislators, kayo as diplomats, shouldn't we reach for the, the higher good, that which gives us uh, more rights, that, that which also gives us siguro um, more leverage, even in these resource-based cooperations we are trying to forge. What I do you will not dispute about? your position, ma'am. Uh, thank you, um, Ambassador. And uh, is the, well, I'm guessing the answer is yes, but just to ask, so uh, is the does the case embody the official position of the DFA? Is it DFA's official position uh, uh, that Section 2 of the Constitution should not apply to our EEZ? We believe it should be applied in a way that's consistent with our UNCLOS obligations. And that's why we have appealed them. In, in situations where it might seem that what the Constitution mandates and what the UNCLOS gives or is able to give, uh, for us Filipinos, which one as Filipinos and also as members of the international community, yung sinasabi po ninyong lahat, community of shared values, uh, which one has precedence? Or uh, uh, to which do we uh, most appeal in the end? There's always a temptation when you see something in constitutions that gives us more, uh, then we should go for it. But the realization is that the, the more that the constitution included, was a misappreciation of the definition of an EEZ under UNCLOS. And the temptation for most countries is always to maximize its interests, as China is doing. It's a massive area claim. Um, if we interpret Article 1 of the Constitution as national territory that includes EEZ, it is also a massive uh, area claim, which we are not agreeing to based on the arbitration decision. We have to follow uh, UNCLOS, ma'am. So it's a bit of a compromise. And like I said, the decision in 2011, uh, it's a landmark decision, uh, excellently written by Justice Carpio. It showed that we can uh, have both worlds. We can have, um, we gave up Treaty of Paris, for example, in that uh, decision by going full on clause. We have given up 
certain internal waters, which are now in archipelagic waters, which is in the constitution. It says the waters around and between uh, islands, regardless of length and breadth, are internal waters. But under that decision, it's now just pockets of internal waters. The rest are archipelagic. I believe that was a wonderful way to approach, uh, to harmonize with international law, uh, what may have been uh, written in the constitution without doing violence uh, to the language. It's really looking to the intent of the drafters. And I believe the drafters wanted to enshrine our uh, benefits we got from the UNCLOS, including the EEZ, but then they felt that they considered it national territory when under UNCLOS it's just that we have exclusive sovereign rights over the resources. Uh, our ter national territory wasn't necessarily extended 200 nautical miles. Uh, speaking of Justice Carpio, ironically, Ambassador, I think he disagrees with what the case is asking the Supreme Court to to rule. But in any case, po, um, I guess it's it's natural that, because speaking about different national interests being advanced by different countries, siempre, siguro yung pinakamataas na expression ng bawat sambayan nandon sa kanika niya mga constitution and maybe uh, international bodies like the UN and conventions like the UNCLOS will will always or or may probably always seem less than what each country's constitution claims kasi nga baka it's an attempt of many countries together to to seek a golden mean and well okay na, na file yun na yung yung kaso i, I wonder if that question couldn't have been better resolved maybe in some uh, genuine constitutional reform process uh, down the road. Uh, or if finally, China gets out of the way of the formation of a code of conduct in the South China Sea or, or co collaborates in a multilateral process there instead of insisting on many piecemeal bilateral processes. But in any case, um, thank you very much for uh, taking my questions. Uh, the, the case filed is very curious, to say the least, and uh, very, very interesting, I think, important. Salamat po, Ambassador. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Teresa. Congressman Marcoleta. Ambassador, did the framers of the Constitution contemplate that our EEZ and Territorial Sea are parts of our national territory? Yes, Your Honor, based on the records. Is it uh, their assumption that um, we have to fight for this as part of our territory? Yung EEC and National ter uh, Territorial Sea. The Territorial Sea is 12 nautical miles, and the EEC is about 200 nautical miles from the baseline. Yun po ba yung pagkakaintindi ng framers of the Constitution na these are parts of our national territory? Yes, sir. It's stated in um, Article 1 of the Constitution. Okay. But considering, as you have stated, our obligations uh, on several treaties and international uh, arrangements, UNCLOS being one, there is a necessity for us to harmonize our constitution and domestic law with that of public international law. That's correct. Uh, I believe so, Your Honor, and it was upheld in a, in a Supreme Court case. Yes, as a matter of fact, if I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, I think former Justice Carpio filed a complaint in the International Court of Justice complaining that uh, Chinese vessels are within uh, the national territory of the Philippines. And the ICJ seems to have rebuked Justice Carpio because he was told that the territorial sea and the economic, exclusive economic zones are not part of the country's national territory. Do you recall that? No, Your Honor, I'm sorry. Because under international law, I think this is an accepted principle that 
EEC and territorial sea are only maritime rights and they do not comprise the territory of the state. The, do you agree? The, up to the territorial sea, sir. It's a national territory under international law. Let, 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 me, let me be clear about that. The maritime zones are... Ganito kasi, no? The, the, uh, the islands, the waters within the islands of the Philippine archipelago are internal waters. Correct? Under the Constitution, yes. Your yes, and uh, 12 miles beyond the baseline is the territorial sea. And another 12 miles from the territorial sea, or 24 nautical miles, is what do you, what do you call that? Contiguous zones. Contiguous zones. And 200 miles away from the baseline is the economic, exclusive economic zones. Paano ngayon po yung ano? Kanina we were we were uh, discussing about Article 123 of the UNCLOS. Sinasabi po kasi doon, I think you can use that as a legal ground also. In uh, in our claim and in your appeal, probably uh, the the Supreme Court may, might have misinterpreted that. Uh, there is a violation of our national territory if we agree to uh, explore the vast resources of the South China Sea with other countries. Can you uh, at least uh, refer to Article 123 as one among the grounds that you can use to pursue the appeal with the Supreme Court? Thank you, Your Honor. Actually, that's uh, 123 during the negotiations UNCLOS was brought about because of the complex situations of some countries where the coastlines enclose uh, a particular sea and the overlaps are so complicated that it's better to try to cooperate rather than to fight over the, the over overlaps. So it's a mandate to negotiate, to work out a solution that could benefit everyone. Yes, sir. Uh, 123 is, could be a strategic option. Thank you. I think you can utilize that as one of the legal grounds with which to pursue our interests in the South China Sea, aside from the uh, traditional fishing grounds as we have raised earlier. Uh, Ambassador, there's another last question. Uh, this representation is curious why we have a we have already a permanent representative to the United Nations stationed in in New York in the persons of Ambassador Antonio Lagdameo Sr. Uh, but we have another permanent representative of the United Na to the United Nations in Geneva in your in your person Ambassador can you uh, please uh, Tell us the basic difference in your functions between the one posted in New York and your function in, in Geneva. Thank you, Your Honor. The United Nations created the four headquarters, uh, New York, um, Geneva, Vienna, and Nairobi. Um, the last three are handling sectoral issues. Right. Um, the one in New York is the one handling everything from the General Assembly to the Security Council issues. Okay. So, for example, Nairobi focuses on environment, Vienna focuses on international crime, on drugs, on nuclear and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Geneva handles human rights, humanitarian law, disaster risk reduction, um, intellectual property. We, we cannot and reduce... WH or info. We, we cannot reduce the... Uh... Let's say, let us support the one in New York and the one in Geneva because the two are, we believe, are sufficient enough to discharge all the functions as required under our obligations with the United Nations. Can we do that? Or we, we can hardly do that? Uh, there was a time when things were simpler, sir, when, uh, in, a, in, a, in a bipolar world. Um, but today, um, the issues are more complicated. Far, far more complicated, sir. And okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, 
Congresswoman Marcoleta. Senator Risa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to, uh, to um, bring some clarity to, to a point that was discussed earlier, because uh, uh, in relation to the questions I raised to the good ambassador, I've been reading, started reading more about the case and also uh, about Justice Carpio, who penned that landmark decision of 2011. And I came upon this Vera Files fact check. By Vera Files, August 2021, an international court did not scold Carpio on WPS issue. So um, there, it was fact checked that uh, Justice Carpio, who has been cited by most people around the table in relation to the West Philippine Sea issues, uh, was not rebuked. Uh, there is a YouTube channel that's peddling that claim that an international court berated retired Supreme Court Associate Justice Antonio Carpio for stating wrong information about the West Philippine Sea. No such event happened. Just for the record, uh, Mr. Chair. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Risa. All right, uh, you're now excused. Uh, thank you, Marcia. Oh. Sir? A few questions po. lang po. Uh, Ambassador Carlos uh, Sureta, uh, nabanggit rin po ni ang colleague natin dito si Senator Alan Peter. Uh, trabaho po kayo before at uh, magaling po raw kayo na diplomat. No? How can your uh, experience at the UN, US and Russia help in your work in uh, Geneva? Na-assign po kayo before sa, sa Russia, sir? L ang last posting ko po, six years as ambassador to Russia, Concurrently, three years in, in Ukraine. And uh, what will be your priorities po dito sa, sa, sa ngayon, pag na-confirm po kayo? One of the uh, issues that faced me when I was in Russia was the sudden increase in the number of uh, Filipino workers. My first year, it was 2,000. By the time I left, it was over 10,000. And 90% were uh, uh, undocumented. Uh, the UN in Geneva is the is is uh, ground zero for the international organization for migration, who helps everyone uh, to try to regularize their stay. Uh, I think that would be one of the priorities uh, to empower uh, the IOM to um, to deal more with the uh, receiving states uh, to ensure the rights of our uh, overseas workers there. Salamat, uh, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Senator Go, Congressman uh, Wiko. Uh, Mr. Chair, to all members of the uh, CME, CA and to the seven honorable ambassadors of the Department of Foreign Affairs, allow me to express my full support for the confirmation of the appointees before us as Philippine ambassadors to the countries of Malaysia, India, Oman, Turkey, Portugal, Saudi Arabia, including a permanent representative to the United Nations. As such, my support comes from the knowing that the appointees will not disappoint with their extensive experience and historic achievements serving as a solid proof. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your uh, manifestation. You are now excused the... Uh... Ambassador Sureta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this juncture, the chair would like to have a minute suspension.
here very soon. Uh, before that, I would like uh, to recall back Ambassador Cortez. Please take your your designated seat. Ambassador Cortez, I just uh, browsed on your uh, 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 the briefer sent to us by the CA. You were discovered by the talent scouts from Viva Films. Sir, in my previous life, yes, I was a... Uh, You're a singer? Yeah, before, sir. Can you render us a song? <laughs> before we confirm you? What song do you want to hear? Uh, Martin Yevera. Ah. <laughs> I th <laughs> think you're. Uh... Oh. You one stanza, to... sir. Ano na? Maski one stanza po. Yeah, well, kahit one one sentence lang. Okay. Be my lady. Come to me and take my hand, and be my lady. Truly, I must let you know that I'm in love with you. All I want is you, how I need you. So please be my lady. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> Ito lang mo na lang, chair. Huh? Thank you very much. At least may light, light moments tayo. Okay, majority leader. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move that the committee recommend to the plenary for the commission to give its consent for the nominations of the seven officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs as listed in the agenda. I so move, Mr. Chair. There is a motion to recommend to the plenary for the commission to give its consent to the nominations of the seven officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs, in the Department of Foreign Affairs namely Henry Sikat Ben Surto Jr., um, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of Turkey with concurrent jurisdiction over Georgia and the Republic of Azerbaijan. Number two, Raul Salavaria Hernandez, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Sultanate of Oman with the salary and emoluments of Chief of Mission Class 1. Number three, Renato Pedro Oabel Villa, Chief of Mission Class 1 as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with concurrent jurisdiction of the Republic of Yemen. Number four, Carlos de Mexoreta, Chief of Mission Class 1 as Permanent Representative of the Republic of the Philippines to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. Number five, Maria Angela Abrera Ponce, Chief of Mission Class 2 as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Malaysia. Number six, Raul Raymond Pashon Cortez, Chief of Mission Class 2, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Portuguese Republic with concurrent jurisdiction of the Republic of Cabo Verde, the Republic of Guinea-Bissau, the, Dem the Democratic Republic of, S of Sao Tome, and Principe and the Republic of Angola. Number seven, Jose Francisco Ignacio, Chief of Mission Class 2, as Ambassador Extraordinary and plenipotentiary to the Republic of India with concurrent jurisdiction over the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal. Is there any objection? Hearing none, the nominations of the seven aforementioned nominees of the, of the Department of Foreign Affairs officials are hereby recommended to the plenary session for approval. Majority Leader. Yes, Mr. Chair, there being no matters to discuss, I move to adjourn this meeting. On motion of the Majority Floor Leader, uh, uh, Senator Ejercito and Julie Seconde, there being no objection, the meeting is hereby adjourned.
Good morning, honorable members of the Commission Appointments, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, uh, the generals and senior officers of the Armed Forces, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. The eighth meeting of the Committee of National Defense of the Commission Appointments in the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Officers and Members of the Committee on National Defense. Vice Chairperson, Senator Maria Lourdes Nancy S. Binay. Senator Francis Chis G. Escudero. Senator Jingoy Ejercito Estrada. Senator Christopher Bong Ki Go. Representative Oscar Oka G. Malapitan. Senator Aimee Marcos. Representative Jose Gay G. Padernos. Representative Johnny T. Pimentel, Senator Francis Tol N. Tolentino, Members, Representative Ferginel G. Biron, MD, Representative Albert S. Garcia, Representative Greg G. Gasataya, Senator Risa Ontiveros, Senator Lauren Legarda, Representative Lani Mercado Revilla, Senator Grace Poe, Representative Manuel T. Sagarbaria, Senator Cynthia A. Villar, ex officio members, Vice Chairperson, Representative Ramon N. Guico Jr., Majority Floor Leader, Representative Luis Raymond L. Ray F. Villaferti Jr., Senate, Assistant Majority Floor Leader, Senator Joseph Victor G. Ejercito, Assistant Majority Floor Leader, Representative Rodanti D. Marcoleta, Minority Floor Leader, Senator Alan Peter Compañero S. Cayetano. The Chairperson is present. Thank you, ma'am. Will the 10 members present in person, including the chair, and five members present online, with a total of 15 members present, the existence of a quorum is hereby declared. Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Chair, I move to defer the reading of the minutes of the previous meetings held on May 23 and 24, 2030, and consider the same as approved. I so move, Mr. Chair. <laughs> There's a motion being seconded, hearing no objection. The motion is hereby approved. Again, good morning, uh, the honorable members of the commission appointments, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning again. Today, your committee is tasked to deliberate on the ad interim appointments of the 86 general and senior officers of the armed forces of the Philippines that were submitted to the committee's jurisdiction for its consideration. Officers, please stand up as your name is called. Romel S. Valencia to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Melchor Domingo P. Albaracin to the rank of Colonel, Dental Service. Cyril P. Dawatin to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Samuel C. Nadala Jr. to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Janet V. Lorena to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Alan Edgar B. Orbeto to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. James Francis P. Lugto to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Aldrin A. Gakusan to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Julien B. Delor to the rank of Cap Captain, Philippine Navy. Rene H. Sevilla to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Claro M. Tamayo Jr. to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Dennis Romel Arhindang to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Maribel B. Manangbao to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Harold V. Hernando to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Ben C. Domingo III to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Marites L. Agliam to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Hostito Jasper M. Pixon to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Ronald M. Pasqua to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Alan Angelo C. Tolentino to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Navy, Marines. John Paul David S. Trajano to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. 
Villamor B. Costales Jr. to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Christian James P. Vigno to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Arnold L. Gasalatan to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Virginia N. Ang to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Abdel Halim H. Sakilan to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Albert C. Flores to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Raimundo C. Picot Jr. to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Allen Van L. Estrera to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Benjo F. Negranza to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Roldi Dean Chris A. Sergio to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Randy C. Hapitana to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Clyde B. Domingo to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Dexter P. Diego to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Alexander P. Balurin to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Mac Xuen M. Karingal to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Richard B. Sumera to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Anselmo A. T. the second to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Glenn S. Piquero to the rank of uh, Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Jose Mari J. Sardeng to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Leopoldo E. Acerden the fourth, rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Crisanto J. Naing to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Emerson V. Sumilang to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Maynard S. Kabungkal to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy with a waiver of personal appearance, your honors. Tino P. Maslan to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Navy, Marines. Steve C. Murata to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Antonio V. Borton to the rank of Colonel, uh, Philippine Army. Renaldo S. Galang to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Tante D. Angangao. Angagao, sorry, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Julito P. Garay to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Ariel B. Kalahi, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Bernard F. Pelobil, Pelobelio, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Ali A. Alejo, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Noli P. Kanashiro, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Joseph C. Galvez, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Juni J. R. Bucinos, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Franco Rafael H. Alano, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Mel Gival B. Hilao, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Juan C. Celebrado, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy, with a waiver of personal appearance, uh, your honors. James S. Ramon Jr., the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Alfred C. Sarmiento, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Jetoni Luke D. De Quiros, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Joe Boy D. Kindipan, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Milano E. Sumera, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Archie A. Aris, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Joseph D. Alejo, the rank of Colonel, Corps of Professors, Reserve. Hernane D.C. Lanes, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Mark Anthony B. Fernandez, the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force, with a waiver of personal appearance, your honors. Renante D. Besa, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Am uh, Army. Omar Fridzkan S. Alpa, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Jeric A. Doliente, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Windel. Frederick T. Rebong to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Ermilino T. Calubiran Jr. to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force with a waiver of personal appearance, your honors. Leo E. Katipay to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Arthur P. Tugade to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force Reserve. Where is he? Oh, there. Morning, sir. Antonio C. Rota Jr. to the rank of Brigadier General. Maria Dolores M. Lim to the rank of Brigadier General. Encarnita Olivia A. Perez to the rank of Colonel Medical Corps. Aldrin S. Anani to the rank of Brigadier General. 
Michel B. Aniron Jr. to the rank of Brigadier General. Ron Do uh, Donald M. Gumiran to the rank of Brigadier General. Fernando M. Reyek to the rank of Major General. Benjamin L. Howe to the rank of Brigadier General with waiver of personal appearance, Your Honors. Ferdinand P. Barandon to the rank of Major General. Manaros M. Buransing II to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Erwin Victoriano A. Machica III to the rank of Brigadier General with waiver of personal appearance, Your Honors. And uh, Erwin A. Alea to the rank of Brigadier General. Madam Secretary, kindly report on the jurisdictional requirements and other pertinent information relative to their ad interim appointments in compliance with the new rules of the commission and the rules of the standing committees madam secretary please thank you mr chairman your honors the ad interim appointments of 86 general and senior officers of the armed forces of the philippines dated march 23 april 4 and 13 2023 under consideration today by the committee were received by the commission secretariat on april 11 17 and 20 2023 and were forthwith referred to the committee on national defense by the senate president and ca chairperson juan miguel migs f zubiri pursuant to section 16 chapters 5 of the new rules of the commission Likewise, on various dates, said 86 ad interim appointments were published in two newspapers of general circulation, the Manila Times and Manila Standard, and broadcast over PTV4, pursuant to Section 2, Article 2 of the Rules of the Standing Committees. All the appointees have complied with the submission of the mandatory documentary requirements as provided in Section 24, Chapter 6 of the New Rules of the Commission. Yesterday, the CA Secretariat received two letters from the Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel J-1, Brigadier General Romel P. Roldan, addressed to the Committee Chairman, Representative Romualdo, requesting for the waiver of personal appearances of the following. 1. Brigadier General Benjamin L. Lahau, who has an official activity from May 31 to June 12, 2023, as the head of Philippine Army's pre-delivery inspection team to conduct inspections of various critical ordinance items at Vietnam and Bulgaria. To Colonel Mark Anthony B. Fernandez, who is currently a student officer, Korean Language Course National Security Course in South Korea. Three, Captain Juan E. Celebrado, who is currently a student of Master's Degree of Social Science in Defense Courts, 43-2023 at the Malaysian Armed Forces Defense College in Malaysia. Four, Colonel Hermilino T. Kalubiran Jr., who is currently the Assistant Defense and Armed Forces Attaché to China. Five, Captain Maynard S. Kabungkal, who tested positive for COVID-19 virus. In lieu of his personal appearance, Captain Kabungkal will join the meeting via video conferencing. And six, Brigadier General Erwin Victoriano A. Machica III, who is one of the delegates who will attend the Executive Committee meeting of the Philippine-United States Mutual Defense Board, Security Engagement Board, to be conducted on June 1-2, 2023, at the Indo-Pacific Command Headquarters, Camp Smith, Hawaii, USA. Due to the effect of Super Typhoon Mawar on Guam, USA, their itinerary and original schedule to leave late in the evening today was rescheduled to 2 p.m. Members of this committee were furnished copies of the letters and the same were uploaded on the online database platform of the commission. There was no opposition filed against any of the appointees under consideration today. That is all, Mr. Chairman, your honors. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Majority Floor Leader. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move that the letters requesting for the waiver of appearances of the aforementioned officers be approved. I so move, Mr. Chair. Is there any objection? The chair hears none. The motion is hereby approved. For the information of the body, Captain Kabungkal is present online. Madam Secretary, please administer the oath to all the appointees present, including Captain Kabungkal, who is present online. Uh, please stand and raise your right hands. May we request Captain Kabungkal to turn on his microphone? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? So help you, God. Captain Kabungkal? Uh, please raise your right hand. Captain, 
Tabungkal. Tabungkal. Ano yun? Did he say? Please, uh, yes. May we request again? Uh, Wala pa rin, sir. Oh. Please, uh, Captain, uh, Captain, Captain Kabungkal, please uh, stand. May we request you to please stand up and raise your right hand? Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, again, yes, okay. Please, Cap oh. Please raise your right hand, Captain Kabungkal. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? So help you, God. Response. I swear the. Please say, I do. Oh, I do. I do. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, no appointees, nominees are now all under oath. Please take your seats. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Snappy. Galing. Um, may we now call on Major General Fernando M. Reyeg. General, sir, the most senior among the appointees under consideration today. Uh, please take the seat in front, sir. You, you may give your uh, opening statement, General uh, Reyeg, if you have any in behalf of the AFP for confirmation today. Your Honours, uh, good afternoon. I am uh, Major General Fernando M. Reyeg, Philippine Army. I am currently the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, J3, of the AFP. I am a member of PMA class 1991. And on behalf of the 85 other general and senior officers with me, we are humbled to appear before this August body for your consideration, your honors. Thank you, General. Uh... The floor is now open for inquiries, if there is any from the members. Uh, uh, manifestation. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Sagarbaria. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would just like to uh, manifest my support to Christian James P. Vigno, to the rank of uh, Colonel, Philippine Army. He's a co-Silimanian, started in Siliman. She's my alma mater, and we have the principles of what we call the via veritas vita, the way, the truth, and the life. So that recommendation stands, Mr. Chair. And also to the 86 ad interim appointments of generals and senior officers of the armed forces of the Philippines. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honorable Sagarbaria. Yes, uh, Senator Nancy Bine. Ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a manifestation of support. I would like to manifest my support for the appointments of Colonel Tino Maslan and Colonel Hermelino Calubiran Jr. Alam niyo po, Mr. Chairman, sila po ay naging bahagi ng aming pamilya nung sila po ay nagsilbe bilang aide ng aking ama nung siya po ay Vice President. Kaya alam ko po ang kanilang dedikasyon para po sa ating bayan. With that, I fully support all our... Uh, uh, appointees this morning. Thank you. Especially the two, uh, Colonel Paslan and Colonel Kalubiran. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Senator uh, Nancy Binay, uh, Honorable Representative uh, Greg Gasataya. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I also would like to manifest my uh, support for the confirmation of the appointment of uh, Army Colonel Christian James Perez uh, Vigno, who was born in Bacolod City and is a native of uh, Kabangkalan City, Negros Occidental, uh, Honorable Chair. So I'd like to uh, manifest my support for his uh, unblemished uh, military service reputation as well as his uh, record. And also to the entire 86 uh, appointees, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Representative Gasataya. Our Vice Chairman, Committee on National Defense, Commission Appointments, uh, Vice Chairman, uh, Senator Christopher Bongo. Sir. Salamat po, uh, Mr. Chair. 
uh, my distinguished colleagues, as uh, vice chair of the Committee on National Defense, uh, let me make of uh, record my full and unwavering support. Uh, isa isa ko na lang po, Senator Binay. Bira lang po tayo. Uh, Meron pagkakataon na mapasalamatan po ang ating mga sundalo na nagsasakripisyo po para sa ating mga kababayan. At uh, salamat po Major General Fernando Rieg ang ating uh, J3, Major General Ferdinand Barandon, J2, Brigadier General Edwin Alea, Brigadier General Michelle Anayron, 403rd Infantry Brigade Commander, Brigadier General Donald uh, Gumiran, 602nd Infantry Brigade, Brigadier General Aldrin Anani, Wing Commander po ng uh, 258th Presidential Air Wing, na katrabaho ko rin po nung uh, panahon ni dating Pangulong uh, Duterte. Colonel Emerson uh, Sumilang, Colonel Leo Katipay, Commandant ng Artillery Training School, Colonel Bernard Pelobelio, Colonel Glenn Piquero, Group Commander ng uh, TOG 2, Colonel Ali Alejo, U9 Visayas Command, Colonel Virginia Ang, CEO po ng uh, Headquarters Service Battalion, Aviation Regiment. Colonel Omar Fridskan Alpa, uh, TOG 11 sa, sa Davao. Colonel uh, Hermilino Kalubiran. Colonel uh, Jetony Lux De Quiros. Colonel Villamor Costales, Group Commander po ng 430th Aircraft Maintenance uh, 5th Fighter Wing. Colonel Nori Kanashiro, Acting Group Commander ng 11th Regional Community Defense Group sa Davao rin po. Navy Captain Julian Dolor. And of but of course, no, uh, I give my uh, unconditional and unwavering support to former Secretary of uh, Transportation, Colonel uh, Arthur Tugade. Sir, ikaw ba yan? Yeah. Sir, tayo ka muna, sir. Minsan lang kitang patayuin, sir. Uh, you have my full support and ad I admire your dedication to public service. Alam ko na nine years mo pong pinaghirapan. Uh, habang nagsisilbi ka rin po uh, as a civilian, three years sa CDC at six years sa DOTR, bukod sa mga ginawa mo as an uh, appointed uh, official, Hinahanapan mo talaga ng panahon para pagdaanan ang proseso ng pagiging full colonel. Uh, ang tanong ko lang po, pwede pa lang ma-promote ang 77 uh, result na po. Pero alam nyo, uh, kahit lampas na po siya ng 77, uh, even though his uh, hands were full sa past positions niya, nag-commit siya, nag-training at gumawa ng thesis, Saludo po ako sa iyo, sir. Salamat po sa iyong buong pusong pagsiservisyo. Siya po ang uh, isa sa mga main proponents po ng Build, Build, Build program nung panahon ni dating Pangulong Duterte. Dapat hindi lang siya ma-promote bilang kernel. Dapat general na po siya pagdating po sa public uh, service. Alam niyo po, malaking uh, ginhawa po sa ating mga kababayan yung uh, ginawa niyong uh, build, build, build uh, program at uh, uh, na maging part po ng uh, administrasyon ni Pangulong Duterte. Masaya po tayong nakikita na yung kaginhawaan po na ibibigay po sa ating mga kababayan itong build, build, build program. Salamat po, sir. At uh, further, let me manifest my support and congratulations to Brigadier General Antonio Rota Jr., Brigadier General Benjamin Howe, Brigadier General Edwin Machica III, Colonel Romel Valencia, Colonel Melchor Alba Racin, Colonel Cyril Dawaten, Colonel Samuel Nadala Jr., Colonel Alan Orbito, Colonel Rene Sevilla, Colonel Claro Tamayo Jr., Colonel Dennis Hindang, Colonel Harold Hernando, Colonel Ben Domingo, Colonel uh, Justito Pexon, Colonel Alan Tolentino, Colonel John Paul Trajano, Colonel Christian Vingno, Colonel Arnold uh, Gasalatan, Colonel Abdel Halim Sakilan, 
Colonel Albert Flores, Colonel Raimundo Picot Jr., Colonel Allen Estrera, Colonel Max Suen Caringal, Colonel Richard Sumera, Colonel Anselmo T. II, Colonel Jose Marie Sardeng, Colonel Leopoldo Acerden IV, Colonel Crisanto Naing, Colonel Tino Maslan, Navy Captain Benjo Negrenza, Navy Captain Roldilin Sergio, Sergio, Navy Captain Randy Hapitana, Navy Captain Dexter Diego, Megorin, baka maganak tiro tayo. Colonel, Navy Captain Alexander Balurin, Navy Captain Clyde Domingo. Dito ba siya? Megorin, baka maganak ko rin to. Navy Captain Hernani Lanes, Navy Captain Juan Celebrado. Navy Captain James Ramon Jr., Navy Captain Joseph Galvez, Navy Captain Steve Morata. Steve Morata? Para naging... Si, yung isang Morata na kamag-anak mo yon, naging aide ni Senator Villar yata. Noon. Naging aide kampre ni uh, former Speaker, uh, Senate President uh, Manny Villar Morata rin po. Navy Captain Maynard uh, Kabungkal, And of course, to our inspiring women in uniform, Brigadier General Maria Dolores Lim, Ma'am, Colonel Marites Agliam, Colonel Josephine Alejo, Colonel Janet Laurena, Colonel Maribel Manangbao, Colonel Encarnita Perez, Colonel Antonio Burton, uh, Colonel Reynaldo Galang, Colonel Tante Angagao, Colonel Julito, uh, Julito Garay, Colonel Ariel Calahi, Colonel Juni, Businios, Colonel Franco Alano, Colonel Melvig, Mel Geval, Hilao, Colonel Alfred Sarmiento, Colonel Joe Boy, Kindipan, Colonel Melanio Sumera, Colonel Archie Ares, Colonel Mark Anthony Fernandez, Colonel Renante Besa, Colonel Jeric Duliente, Colonel Windel Ribong, Colonel Manaros Boransing, Navy Captain James Lugto, Navy Captain Aldrin Gakusan, Navy Captain Ronaldo Pasqua. Ang inyong sakripisyo po at uh, serbisyo sa ating bansa at para sa ating mga kababayan ay walang katulad mula pa noon, panahon ng Marawi uh, hanggang sa COVID-19. Kayo rin po yung mga frontliners. Maraming maraming uh, salamat po sa inyong serbisyo. Kami po ay nandirito lang po mula nung panahon ni Pangulong Duterte to support you hanggang ngayon. Full support po kami sa inyo. Maraming salamat po sa inyong servisyo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, our Vice Chairman, Committee on National Defense, Commission Appointments, Vice Chairman, uh, Senator Christopher uh, Bongo. Uh, before we proceed, uh, Senator Risa Untiveros would like to profound some questions. A question, actually it's not a question, clarificatory question only for Major General Barandon. General Reg, please, your excuse. General Barandon, please. General Ferdi. Before you, please sit down. Before you proceed, I would like to thank on behalf of Northern Mindanao, Fort ID, for making our region so peaceful and you're being replaced by General Mitch and Iron. Thank you so much for the service, especially for the much, province sir. of Kamikin. Anyway, you're, actually it's clarificatory question. Your profile and investigation report general prepared by the CA's Appointments Review and Investigation Service reveals that record check with the CHR declosed that the good general is a respondent in CHR case number CHR 10 X 2022-0377 filed by a, miss, by a Miss Fabricante in connection with actions the General Luke uh, took as then commander the 403rd Infantry Brigade in Bukidnon. CHR directed the officer to file a verified response on May 19, uh, 19 May 2023. In compliance, a response was sent to CHR on 23rd May 2023. Uh, can Major General uh, Barandon briefly tell this committee what this case is all about and what his reply to the CHR complaint? Uh, General Barandon, please. Thank you, sir. To the Honorable Chair and to the 
uh, honorable members of this August uh, body, good afternoon. As a background, sir, uh, that complaint arose from a, uh, a, a complaint coming from a certain Resabet Fabricante, an illegal settler that occupies illegally a, uh, a portion of uh, a military reservation in Camp Osito di Bahian in Malay Balay City. He uh, actually filed a complaint allegedly citing that I prevented her family from applying an electrical connection from the local uh, electric cooperative. And that complaint actually uh, uh, specifically stated that I uh, abused my authority as well as uh, other uh, complaints. And I got wind of that complaint when I applied a uh, CHR or a uh, Commission on Human Rights uh, uh, clearance. In response, sir, I submitted my affidavit denying her allegations that I uh, was instrumental in uh, uh, preventing him, her from applying that uh, electrical connection. And that, as, and that uh, uh, affidavit was already submitted to CHR Region 10, sir. Thank you. General Barandon. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator Riza. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank Your you. excuse. Thank you, sir. Um, Majority Floor Leader. Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move to recommend to the yeah. plaintiff for the commission. Yeah, before we I mean, recommend, I, uh, uh, sorry, I uh, would like to hear from uh, Representative Marcoleta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's uh, still another one. A clarificatory question also. I find uh, in the records, Mr. Chair, Assistant Majority Leader, that uh, Colonel Janet Laurena her marriage with uh, a certain Risaldo and Lorena was declared Null and void up in issue. May, may we please uh, be apprised? Yes, uh, Colonel uh, of the Lorena. The case. Ma'am? Ma'am, anong province nga ang province mo? I'm from Cavite City. Kung anong kabalo mo ka magbisaya? Hindi ako makabalo, sir. Oh, di ba na kabalo? Sorry. I was assigned in Mindanao. Uh, ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, please proceed. Colonel, uh, I'm just curious to know that this uh, your marriage with your previous husband was declared null and void ab initio, grounded on Section 35 of the Family Code, which is any of the two, uh, bigamous or polygamous marriage. Okay. Sino po yung nagkaroon ng bigamous or polygamous marriage before you contracted this marriage? Kayo po ba o yung husband din yun? No, sir. I'm not the one. But the, my, my former husband, sir. Ah, okay. Kailan po kayo ay kinasal? A 2000. 2000 and your marriage was declared null and void in 2019. 2019, sir. Uh, by the Regional Trial Court in Taguig. Tama po? Yes, sir. Your Honor. So, sino po yung nag-file ng petition? Your Honor, ako po. So, are we assuming that only after 19 years did you discover that your husband has contracted a previous marriage other than yours? Uh, actually, Your Honor, after the wedding... Alam nyo na po na may asawa siyang iba. After the wedding po, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, just after the wedding, doon nyo lang nalaman na meron siya palang dating naging asawa. Yes, po, sir. But uh, you still cohabited with him and nagkaroon kayo ng tatlong anak. Your, your Honor, yes, sir. So despite the fact na nagkaroon kayo ng tatlong anak, pinaanal mo pa rin. Yes, Your Honor. Why did you uh, wait for 19 years? 
to have it annulled, considering that one day after your marriage, nalaman mo, meron palang sekreto yung asawa mo. You will only know the person if you will, uh, you will be together for a long time. But um, only to find out, and I realize that the incompatibility arises after a year, sir. Meaning, kung naging compatible kayo, hindi mo siya pinaanal, despite the fact na meron siyang ibang naging asawa. Actually, that is my burden on my part. Uh, actually, Your Honor, I almost, I always and every day thinking, what will I do? Do I need to do the right thing? Because we have our children to uh, be protected, Your Honor. Yan nga, it goes kasi on uh, the kind of judgment that you will take. Uh, dahil, sana kung nalaman mo after 15 years, tumulang nalaman, medyo normal pa yun eh, na doon ka magpapaanal. But immediately, one day after the marriage, nalaman mo meron pala siyang ibang asawa. But... Uh, you didn't mind it in the first place hanggang sa magkaroon kayo ng tatlong anak. Um, Your Honor, uh, I really mind it, sir. Uh, every day, I always think of it. Then, I don't know, I'm not, I'm, maybe, uh, I, that time, I really need a good advisor. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'm not going to belabor the issue. Uh, gusto ko lang kasing malaman na uh, kung kailan niya nalaman yung uh, bigamous marriage. So it happened one day after pala, but she decided to continue the marriage thinking that uh, she will find uh, she will find him com compatible. Ang nangyari, after 19 years, hindi pala kayo compatible, madam. Only after 19 years, tama? No, no, Your Honor, not 19 years. I filed my annulment um, 20, 2015. And it was annulled in 2019. Yes, Your Honor. From then on, uh, Madam, wala ka nang... Uh, Walang lumigaw na sa'yo? Wala, sir. Kasi, no, wala, sir. Kasi I'm using the last name, Lorena. But once it, my application from uh, the change of surname from Lorena to Victorio, maybe that's... <laughs> right now, I'm, using, I'm still using the Lorena name, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Marcoleta. Ma'am, your excuse. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, there are no more inquiries on the part of the appointees or the nominees. Uh, majority floor leader. Yes, Mr. Chair, since there are no more questions, I recommend to the plenary for the commission to confirm the interim appointments of the generals of 86 general and senior officers of the armed forces of the Philippines. I so move, Mr. Chair. There is a motion uh, to by the majority floor leader to recommend the plenary for to recommend to the plenary for the commission to confirm the ad interim appointments of 86 general and senior officers in the armed forces of the Philippines and being seconded without any objection. The same is hereby approved. Majority floor leader. Yes, Mr. Chair, there, are no, there being no matters to discuss, I move to adjourn this meeting. Yeah, on motion of the majority floor leader with, uh, without any objection, the meeting is hereby adjourned. Congratulations.
the 21st plenary session of the Commission appointments of the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. May I call on, she'll be online, but I'll call on Senator Grace Po to lead the chamber in prayer. Sa ngala ng Ama, ng Anak, ng Espiritu Santo, Amen. Panginoon, sa pagtatapos ng ikaunang sesyon ng ikalabing siyam ng Kongreso, kami lubos na nagpapasalamat sa bawat biyaya at paggabay mo sa aming lahat. Inaalay namin ang aming mga ginagawa sa iyo at sa aming bayan. Gabayan po ninyo kami sa paghahanap ng kalutasan sa mga suli na rin namin. Tulungan mo po kaming dinggin at tugunan ang bawat hinaing ng aming mga kababayan. Amen. Sa ngala ng Ama, ng Anak, ng Espiritu Santo. Amen. The Secretary will please call the roll of members. Oh, sorry. My apologies. I always forget the most important part of this meeting, to give homage to our uh, flag and country. Be please remain standing for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Lupang hinirang, tuyan ka ng magiting Sa manlulupi, di ka pasisihil Sa dagat at bundok, sa simoy at sa langit mong magaw May hiradang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal Ang isa't ng mataw at mo'y tagumpay na nagiligin Ang bituin at araw niya, kailan pa may di magdidilim Lupa ng araw ng walhat at pasinta Buhay ay langit sa piling mo Ang inigaya na pag may mga api Ang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo Secretary, please call the roll of members. The Honorable Members of the Commission on Appointments, Maria Lourdes Nancy S. Binay, Virginelle G. Biron, Alan Peter Compañero S. Cayetano, Joseph Victor G. Ejercito, Francis Cheese G. Escudero, Jingoy Ejercito Estrada, Albert S. Garcia, Greg G. Gasataya, Christopher Bong T. Go, Ramon N. Guico Jr., Risa Ontiveros, Loren Legarda, Oscar Oka G. Malapitan, Rodante D. Marcoleta, Amy R. Marcos, Lani Mercado Revilla, Jose Gay G. Padiernos, Johnny T. Pimentel, Grace Poe. Present. Jordin Jesus M. Romualdo. Manuel T. Sagarbaria. Francis Toll N. Tolentino. Luis Raymond L. Ray F. Villafuerte Jr. Cynthia A. Villar. The chairperson is present. With 13 senators, pre uh, 13 rather, members of the commission appointments present in person, and six members present online with total membership of 19. The chair declares the presence of the quorum. Uh, Majority Leader. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move to dispense with the reading of the journals of the plenary sessions held on 23 and 24 May 2020 and consider the same as approved. I assume, Mr. Chair. There be no objection to the motion. Motion is approved. Mr. Chair, may we now proceed to consider the recommendation of the Committee on Foreign Affairs on the nomination of seven officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs. There I be no objection to the motion. Motion is approved. Mr. Chair, I move that the chairperson of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, the better one, be recognized. Kuya. Senator Kuya. Jingoy Ernesto yes. Estada. Yes. Sibling love. Our distinguished colleague from San Juan, Senator Jingoy Estrada, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to the uh, Assistant Majority Floor Leader. Hmm. The good one. <laughs> Mr. President, distinguished members of the uh, Commission on Appointments, this representation as your chairperson of the Committee on Foreign Affairs presided the very first public hearing of the CA for the 19th Congress last August 31, 2022. This morning, this representation presided one of the last public hearings of the Commission before the CNDA 
adjournment of the first regular session. We would like to recognize the work of our esteemed colleagues, their cooperation and active participation in our proceedings in vetting all appointments which pass through our committee. I would like to also recognize the tireless work of the CA Secretariat, the staff from the Committee Affairs, Technical Support Service, Investigation and Appointments Review, Data Bank and Library Service, Sergeant at Arms, and all others, especially the uh, Secretary, Secretary Mayra Villarica, who ably supported us in the performance of our constitutional mandate in scrutinizing the credentials of those who would occupy positions of power and influence in our national government. Thank you very much to all of you as you allowed your committee over the course of nine months to approve a total of 113 appointments and promotions, including that of our top diplomat, the DFA secretary. Without much further ado, it is my distinct privilege to sponsor before this august body the appointments of seven officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs as ambassadors whom we all found to be fit and qualified after careful and rigorous deliberations, and to respectfully recommend that this body give its consent to the nominations of, number one, Henry Sikad Bensurto, Jr., Chief of Mission Class One, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of Turkey with concurrent jurisdiction over Georgia and the Republic of Azerbaijan. He is a career senior diplomat with 38 years of foreign service, a lawyer and a teacher, and one of the country's leading experts on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, who served as head of the DFA legal team on the West Philippine Sea issue and the critical member Philippine delegation to The Hague on the Philippine Arbitration versus China and the South China Sea from 2013 up to 2016. He is presently the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Consular Affairs at the DFA Home Office. Number two, Carlos Demek Soreta, Chief of Mission Class One, as Permanent Representative of the Republic of the Philippines, the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. He is currently the DFA Sec Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and International economic relations. He also served as our ambassador to the Russian Federation and was director general of the Foreign Service Institute. He, has a mem he was a member of the legal team on the West Philippine Sea and has been deployed as deputy permanent representative at the Philippine Mission to the United Nations in New York and deputy chief of mission at the Philippine Embassy in Washington, D.C. Number three, Raul Salavaria, Hernandez, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Sultanate of Oman with the salary and emolument of Chief of Mission Class One. He has been a public servant and respected diplomat for 29 years. We all recognize him in his previous capacities as Assistant Secretary for Legislative Liaison Unit and DFA Spokesperson. He was our ambassador to the to the Republic of Korea from 2014 up to 2019, and ambassador to Turkey from 2019 to 2020. Number four, Renato Pedro Oabel Villa, Chief of Mission Class One, as ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Yemen. Since August 2021, he is Assistant Secretary, DFA Mindanao in Davao City. He earned the distinction of being the first overseas Filipino worker who became an ambassador upon his assumption as our ambassador to Kuwait from 2015 to 2018. He also served as, as Deputy Chief of Mission. Philippine Embassy, Washington, D.C., USA, until June of 2021. Number five, Paul Raymond Pasion Cortez, Chief of Mission Class Two, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Portuguese Republic, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Cabo Verde, 
the Republic of Guinea-Bissau, the, De the Democratic Republic of Sao Tome and Principe, and the Republic of Angola. Our Baguio City Board nominee is the DFA Assistant Secretary for Migrant Workers, who led the assistance to national operations, including the mass repatriations of OFWs during the pandemic and Filipinos in conflict areas. Prior to this assignment, he also served as Consul General in the Philippine Consulate General in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and Director of the ASEAN Affairs in the Home Office. Number six, Josel Francisco Ignacio. Chief of Mission Class Two, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of India, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal. He is currently assigned at the Philippine Consulate General in Shanghai, People's Republic of China, as Consul General. He also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary and Executive Director of the Office of Asian and Pacific Affairs. He also held the positions of Minister and Head of Political Section in Philippine Embassy in Tokyo, Japan, and First Secretary and Consul in Philippine Embassy and Permanent Mission in Vienna, Austria. Last but not the least, Maria Angela Abrera Ponce, Chief of Mission Class Two, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Malaysia. She is DFA Assistant Secretary for Maritime and Ocean Affairs Office and currently the Senior Special Assistant to the Office of the Secretary. She was also Assistant Secretary for Treaties and Legal Affairs. She has been posted to permanent missioning of the Philippines to the United Nations, New York, as Minister and Legal Advisor and to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, as Deputy Permanent Delegate. Mr. President, as we observe the flag days from May 28 to June 12, it is my honor to recommend that this body give its consent to the nominations of the seven career officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs as our newest ambassadors who will be the flag bearers and representatives of the Philippine government in their respective overseas posts. I so move, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Major Leader. Mr. Mr. Chair, before we act on the motion, their number, um, our uh, vice chair, of the commission would like to deliver his uh, seconding speech. I move that he be recognized. Our distinguished colleague of the, from the province of the great province of Pangasinan, Senate uh, Congressman Ramon Guico is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chair, I am pleased to convey my support for the confirmation of the honorable ambassadors under consideration of the commission on appointments. As professionals who represent our republic in a foreign land, I anticipate your full dedication to maintain or uplift the good standing of the Philippines, promote goodwill, emanate Filipino values, and protect our fellow men. These are just my simple words as you embark on your country of destination. Therefore, let it be known that I second the confirmation of the seven ambassadors under the Department of Foreign Affairs. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, our co-chair, Senator JV, Majority Leader. Mr. Chair, may we reiterate the earlier motion for the Commission to give its consent to the nominations of the aforementioned seven officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs. I so move, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, we have a... Uh, uh, Raise hands from Senator Bongo. Senator Go, you recognize? Mr. Chair, as uh, Vice Chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, I would like to, ex to second the motion to confirm the nominations of the officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Sa pagtupad ng inyong mga tungkulin, gawin ninyo lahat ng inyong makakaya to the best of your ability to uphold the uh, rights and safety of our fellow Filipinos abroad. Our OFWs abroad must have direct access to you. Our ambassadors, dapat mas maramdaman ng ating mga kababayan sa abroad ang presensya ninyo, lalo na po sa panahon na sila po'y lubos na nangangailangan. 
hindi na dapat pang dumaan sa social media, radyo, telebisyon at iba pang panawagan ng ating mga OFWs upang humingi po ng tulong. Our ambassador should always live and serve championing the rights, welfare, and interests of our OFWs. Yung mga kababayan nating hopeless, helpless, at lalo na yung walang matakbuhan. This function of yours is, for me, more important than meeting with fellow dignitaries. Kayo po ang extension ng gobyerno ito sa host countries ninyo, kaya dapat ang servisyo ninyo as head of post ay laging handa at walang pinipiling tao o oras. Ito lang ang aking simpleng pakiusap po sa inyo, lagi ninyong unahin ang kapakanan at interes ng ating mga kababayan, ating mga OFWs, our migrant workers, our modern day heroes. Pakinggan ninyo ang kanilang mga hinaing at uh, sumaklolo kaagad sa kanila pag meron silang mga problema. As ambassadors, you carry the hopes and aspirations of our beloved country. We are placing our utmost trust and confidence in each and every one of you, believing that you will rise to the challenge and surpass expectations in your diplomatic endeavors. Congratulations po sa inyo lahat. Thank you very much. Before I act on the motion of the Majority Floor Leader, I'd like to also share the sentiments of Senator Bongo. Uh, my dear ambassadors, you are the face of the Filipino people abroad. Uh, when you meet with the dignitaries, potential investors, and even taking care of our OFWs, kayo po ang muka ng gobyerno at ng inambayan. So I, I pray that you will do a great job. I know you will do a great job. Many of you have been ambassadors in the past or worked with the, or working uh, very well with the DFA. And a special mention, I'd like to say this, uh, to uh, Ambassador Ben Surto Jr. I, was, I got a special call from Senator Franklin Velon, who loves you. I said you took care of him when he was in California and uh, he truly appreciates it. And to all the others I've worked before in many capacities in the different administrations in the past. So I wish you the best, Godspeed, and may God bless you more in life and protect you from uh, any harm that may come upon you doing your job as ambassadors in these faraway lands. So mabuhay po kayo. Without further ado, the commission hereby it's, gives its consent to the nomination of the aforementioned seven officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Congratulations. Please proceed. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, may we now proceed to, the consi to consider the recommendation of the Committee on National Defense on the ad interim appointments of the 86 general and senior officers of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. I so move, Mr. Chair. There be no objection to the motion. Motion is approved. Mr. Chair, I move that the chairperson of the Committee on National Defense, Representative Jordan Jesus Gigi Romualdo, be recognized. Our distinguished gentleman from the beautiful <laughs> island province of Kamigin, which I encourage everyone to visit, uh, is recognized, Congressman J.J. Romualdo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors. But before that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank very much our CA Secretariat, Attorney Myra Villarica, and to all honorable members of the Commission on Appointments, Daghan good gang salamat for the support, especially for the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the Commission on Appointments, again, good afternoon. This representation, as chairperson of the Committee on National Defense, presided over a public hearing this morning to deliberate on the 86 ad interim appointments of general and senior officers in the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Your committee, after deliberating on their qualifications and fitness during the public hearing, determined that they are fit and qualified to be promoted to the ranks where they are appointed and therefore ruled to recommend to the plenary for the commission to confirm the ad interim appoints, appointments of the following. Fernando M. Reyeg to the rank of Major General, 
Ferdinand T. Barandon to the rank of Major General, Aldrin S. Anani to the rank of Brigadier General, Michelle B. Anayron Jr. to the rank of Brigadier General, Benjamin L. Howe to the rank of Brigadier General with a waiver of personal appearance, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors, Antonio C. Rota Jr. to the rank of Brigadier General, Donald M. Gumiran to the rank of Brigadier General, Erwin A. Alea to the rank of Brigadier General, Erwin Victoriano A. Machica III to the rank of Brigadier General with a waiver of personal appearance, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors, Maria Dolores M. Lim to the rank of Brigadier General, Juni J. R. Bosinos to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Christian James P. Vigno to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Joboy D. Kendipan to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Franco Rafael H. Alano to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Ariel B. Kalahi to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Wendell Frederick T. Rebong to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Manaros M. Buransing II to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Antonio V. Burton to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Renante D. Besa to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Abdel Halim H. Sakilan to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Romel S. Valencia to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Bernard F. Pelobilio to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Albert C. Flores to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Ben C. Domingo III to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army, Cyril P. Dawaten to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Ali A. Alejo to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Virginia N. Ang to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Marites L. Agliam to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Raimundo C. Picot Jr. to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Milano E. Somera to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Velhival B. Hilao to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Emerson V. Sumilang to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Reynaldo S. Galang to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Noli P. Kanashiro to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Jasper Hosti Hostito M. Pexon to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Tante D. Angagao to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Samuel C. Nadala Jr. to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Janet V. Laurena to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Archie A. Ares to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Arnold L. Gasalatan to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Allen Van L. Estrera to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Leo E. Katipay to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Edgar Alan B. Orbito to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. Julito P. Garay to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Army. James Francis P. Lugto to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Hernane D. C. Lanes to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy, Aldrin A. Gakusan, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy, Benjo F. Negranza, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy, Juan E. Celebrado, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy, with a waiver of personal appearance, uh, Mr. Chairman, your honors, Roldidin Chris A. Sergio, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Julien B. Dolor, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Randy C. Hapitana, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Maynard S. Kabunka, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy, with a waiver of personal appearance, Mr. Chairman, your honors. Steve C. Murata, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. 
Joseph C. Galvez, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Tino P. Maslan, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Navy Marines. Clyde B. Domingo, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Dexter P. Diego, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Ronaldo M. Pasqua, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Alexander P. Balurin, to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. James S. Ramon Jr., to the rank of Captain, Philippine Navy. Allen Angelo C. Tolentino, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Navy, Marines. Omar Fridskan S. Alpa, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Rene H. Sevilla, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Hermelino D. Calubiran Jr., to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force, with waiver of personal appearance, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors. Mark Anthony B. Fernandez, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force, Air Force, also with waiver of personal appearance, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors. John Paul David S. Trajano, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Max Schwen M. Karingal, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Claro M. Tamayo, Jr., to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Alfred C. Sarmiento, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Leopoldo E. Acerden IV, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Jeric A. Doliente, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Richard B. Sumera, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Crisanto J. Naing, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Jetoni Luke D. De Quiros, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Anselmo A. T. II, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Villamor B. Costales, Jr., to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Dennis Romel Arhindang, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Maribel B. Manangbao, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Harold V. Hernande, Hernando, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Glenn S. Piquero, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Jose Mari J. Sardeng, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force. Encarnita Olivia A. Perez, to the rank of Colonel, Medical Corps. Melchor Domingo P. Albaracid, to the rank of Colonel, Dental Service. Arthur P. Tugade, to the rank of Colonel, Philippine Air Force Reserve. Josephine D. Alejo, to the rank of Colonel, Corps of Professors Reserve. I so move, Mr. Chairman, Your Honor. Thank you very much, Majority Leader. But before we uh, uh, recognize the Majority Leader, it's good to see familiar faces, particularly the former Secretary of the Department of Transportation. I was expecting him to join the Coast Guard. <laughs> but it is, I'm glad to see him here today. Congratulations, Colonel Tugade. Uh, Yes, Majority Leader. Yes, Mr. Chair, before we act on the motion, there are a number of the members of the Commission who would like to give their seconding, seconding speeches. The first would be our Vice Chair of the Commission, Congressman Juan Ching I move that he be recognized. Our distinguished colleague, the Vice Chair of the Commission Appointments, no other than Representative Mon Ramon Monching Guico, is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chair, I wish to acknowledge the military officers of the Department of National Defense present today and express my wholehearted support for their confirmation. Let me commend the Gitinatuturid nga soldado nga anak iti probinsya ti Pangasinan, namely Colonel Claro Baliknab Tamayo Jr., Colonel Edgar Alan Bongolan Orbito, Colonel Ilanyo E.Y. Sumera. I believe that they will act on the best interest of the country and in line with the social and moral obligations expected to them. I hereby second the confirmation of the 86 appoint appointees under the Department of National Defense. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Maraming salamat. 
Co-Chairman. Mr. Chair, the seconding speech of Senator Bongo, he asked that it be inserted to the records. Yes, we take note of the motion of Senator Bongo. Mr. Chair, may we reiterate the earlier motion of the Commission to confirm the ad interim appointments of the aforementioned 86 general and senior officers of the armed forces of the Philippines. I so will, Mr. Chair. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, I see a lot of familiar faces. One of them is Colonel Vigno, who was my, our battalion commander in Maramag, who took care of uh, helping us uh, fend off the insurgency there. It's now a very peaceful area. Marami salamat sa inyo. Many of you have served in Bukidnon in, and in Mindanao. And as a Mindanao, and I thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts that uh, we, are now, we are now experiencing a long period of peace. And as a matter of fact, if we continue with this peace, I surmise that we may have a double-digit growth rate in the very near future. Dahil uh, talagang napakayaman ng natural resources ang Mindanao. Ang kailangan lang natin kapayapaan. And I thank you all for that. And I thank you all for your service to your country, to our country, to our flag and nation. Many of you, I know, uh, face uh, sometimes insurmountable odds, but you have it in you being members of the Marines, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force to always look at the interest of the country above all else, sacrificing even your lives. Kaya sa lahat ng commission appointments hearings, I always thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for the service that you give to your country. We are celebrating or we are enjoying these democracies that we are having here today as members of both the Senate and the House of Representatives and the freedoms that we enjoy in our daily lives because of the sacrifices that you all make. Kaya mabuhay po kayo lahat. And without further ado, the ad interim appointment of the 86th General and Senior Officers of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, I hereby confirm congratulations, ladies and gentlemen of the military. Mr. Chair, sure there being no mat other matters to discuss, I move to adjourn. Before I do that, uh, Your Honor, may I just read a accomplishment report for the CA? I think we'll all be proud of this accomplishment report. Since many of you are absent from your Senate or your House sessions, it's good that they hear what we have done, and that is why sometimes you're either late or absent. Before we adjourn, I'd just like to thank you, my dear colleagues, for a very productive first regular session of the 19th Congress of the Commission Appointments. Sa ating mga uh, kapatid sa House of Representatives, maraming salamat sa uh, inyong hard work and dedication, dedication na binibigay niyo sa Commission Appointments. I'm happy to report here today that we have confirmed a total of 597 nominations and appointments. Let me repeat, 597 nominations and appointments. Of this number, 20 are cabinet secretaries, 452 are officers of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, 119 are officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, and uh, one is from the JBC, and five are from the Constitutional Commissions. In comparison, ladies and gentlemen, in the same period last year, we only confirmed 328 during the 18th Congress and 218 were confirmed during the 17th Congress. Sa sobrang sipag po ninyong lahat, palagi pong naapektuhan ang schedule ng session dito sa Senado. Hindi ko sinulat yan. Stop po yan. Kaya muli, maraming maraming salamat po sa maayos nating nagampanan, ang ating mga tungkulin bilang tagasuri ng mga appointees at nominees ng isinilang dito sa Commission on Appointments. Kaya mabuhay po ang Commission Appointments. Mabuhay po tayo natin. Thank you very much. So, so without further ado, there is a motion with no objection. The session is hereby adjourned for this first regular session of Congress. Maraming maraming salamat po.